Good evening, everyone, and welcome. We'll call to order this Bloomington City Council meeting. Tonight is Monday, February 12th, 2024. Thank you for everyone who is joining us here in the council chambers, everybody watching at home online. We will start our meeting as we always do. If you're able, please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Once again, thanks for everybody being with us this evening. Our first order of business tonight, Council, is to adopt our agenda. And our agenda, we've got a, a number of things under item two, our introductory items. We'll start with item 2.1, which is a, uh, a review of the 2024 work plan for our Parks, Arts, and Recreation Commission. We will then get a, uh, an update from Dr. Nick Kelly on our public health workforce. Uh, items 2.3 through 2.8, we're going to be doing a bunch of appointments as we typically do this time of year. We're going to be making appointments to the following boards of commissions, Parks, Arts, and Recreation, Advisory Board of Health, Creative Placemaking, Human Rights Commission, Sustainability Commission, and the Local Board of Review. And that's uh, item two, our introductory items. Our consent business is 16 items long this evening, and Councilmember Rivas has our consent business for us this evening. Under our hearings, resolutions, and ordinances, and our organizational business, uh, we go full-on planning tonight. Uh, we've got all kinds of planning-related things. Item 4.1 is a uh, miscellaneous uh, issues ordinance, the cumulative nonconformity. Non Item 4.2 is a resolution initiating rezoning of parcels northwest of Lindale Avenue and the 94th Street intersection. Under our organizational business, we have three study items. One is a study item regarding the environmental standards review for low density residential. Study item 5.2 is the RS1 zoning district review, and 5.3 is to discuss accessory dwelling units, fence, and window covering standards. We will, con we will wrap up, as we always do, with item 5.4, our City Council policy and issue update. Council, are there any additions or corrections to tonight's uh, agenda? Mr. Verbrugge? Uh, Mr. Mayor, Council, if you would, just uh, to acknowledge for the record that Councilmember Carter is participating virtually this evening. You beat me to it. I was going to do it as we move to approve the agenda tonight. We're going to have to do our votes by roll call vote because of uh, Councilmember Carter and uh, not being with us this evening. So, Council, any, any changes or, or if not, I will move approval of tonight's agenda. Second. Got a motion and a second by Councilmember Lohman to approve tonight's agenda. No further Council discussion on this. Ms. Mercer. Aye. Can you turn on your microphone, please? There we go. Sorry. Councilmember Carter. Aye. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Aye. Councilmember Lohman. Aye. Councilmember Mua. Aye. Councilmember Nelson. Aye. And Councilmember Rivas. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries 7 0. We have an agenda for this evening. And first up on that agenda is a review of the Parks, Arts, and Recreation Commission 2024 work plan. Uh, our city charter requires us to. Uh, for all of our boards and commissions to get a, a work plan from each of them at the start of the year. And so we'll start that process uh, tonight with our Parks, Arts, and Recreation Commission. We have our Park Director, Ann Catry, with us tonight and the Chair of our Park Commission, uh, Laura Peral. Good evening and welcome. Good evening. Thank you. All right, Mr. Mayor, Council, thank you for allowing me to present the Parks, Arts, and Recreation Commission 2024 work plan to you. Um, I am the chair of the commission, and I am presenting on behalf of all the commissioners to you this evening. Chair, if I could ask you to move the microphone a little bit closer. There we sure. go. Thank you. All right, so before we dive into 2024, we wanted to spend a little time um, discussing the 2023 park key accomplishments. Um, first on the list was our park projects related to our park system master plan. Um, the commission has been very involved, as you know, in the Park System Master Plan. We've received monthly progress updates on both Bryant and Trepa Park as they've been progressing through all the stages of development. We've been hearing and responding to resident feedback along the way, and we're very pleased with how the design of the parks have been so responsive to what we've heard from the community. Additionally, the co commission has been involved in the Smith Park Playground update. At this playground, we added a ninja 
um, style challenge course. I'm really excited to finally deliver on an unmet need in our community with this really cool and innovative playground. The commission considered um, community feedback and reviewed and recommended the playground design. The commission is really excited to be a part of the spring 2024 grand opening. In 23, we also worked on an Adopt a Park program. We reviewed and recommended guidelines and policies for both the program, as well as a new city webpage interface for residents and community groups. Residents now have avenues to actively participate in the maintenance of our parks. We also worked on a park maintenance and operational plan. This is really exciting because this is another thing that came from our park system master plan. We're, we'll be reviewing and recommending adoption to the council in early 2024 on this plan. This is really exciting work that's gonna help establish um, common expectations for maintenance across all of our parks, as well as resources required to meet those expectations. We're gonna set levels of service for maintenance for all parks and amenities, as well as assign needed financial and staff resources to match that level of service. Finally, in 2023, we put forth a donations and memorial policy. The commission reviewed and made recommendations for this policy. This policy allows for generous and much appreciated contributions to our parks while managing them as public spaces for all to enjoy while creating um, standard, a standardization and expectations for all donors as well as city staff. In addition to those initiatives I've just outlined, the commission partic participated in some annual work plan projects. We tour Bloomington parks and facilities every year. Highlights this year, we're having meetings on site at Creekside Community Center, BIG, as well as getting into the parks and spending some time at both Bryant and Trepaw at various stages in planning through the park redesign. Our commissioners also participate annually in the Cultural Arts Support Grant Funding Review and recommendations, and one to two park commissioners are a part of this review process every year. We also annually review budget fees in our 10-year capital improvement plan, as well as staying very engaged in all of our park planning and park projects through the Park System Master Plan. <laughs> all right. There we go, shifting into 2024. Our commission initiatives, I want council to take note that we have a very big uh, list of initiatives for 2024 and the commission is so excited to partake in all of these initiatives um, and the huge impact that they're gonna make on our community. So first, the park maintenance and operations plan. I talked a little bit about this in 2023 and this will be forthcoming um, for adoption um, in this year. Um, this process is going to set consistent standards of maintenance and it's going to improve our operations, safety, and user experience across all the parks. So really important work there. The Commission's also going to be working on an urban forestry master plan. We're going to review this plan and make recommendations for Council. The Commission has been um, getting some updates and giving feedback related to the Three Rivers Park District Partnership for um, operations at Highland Greens. I've been a part of the Highland Greens project for a while now. I was actually a, actually a original member on the task force. And as a task force member, the priorities and the voice of the community was very focused around maintaining golf in the city of Bloomington as a very important asset, as well as maintaining and preserving our green space. Through the Three Rivers Park District partnership, the commission believes that we will be able to meet those priorities that the Highland Greens task force outlined um, almost 10 years ago, I believe. So really exciting um, to, to share more with the council about that this year as well. The commission will also be reviewing a Three Rivers Park District uh, maintenance agreement across all regional parks, as well as making recommendations regarding future operations and maintenance of Bloomington's regional parks. Next up is the Bloomington Forward Project, and I know the community is incredible, or the commission is incredibly honored to be working on all three of the Bloomington Forward projects. And um, this year, the commission will serve as a key stakeholder by or participating in community engagement, review project plans, or yep, reviewing and recommending concepts, project plans, as well as pricing strategies. 
Also on the agenda for 24 is a sidewalk plowing reduction plan. Park will support staff as needed for community engagement, as well as making recommendations around levels of service for sidewalk plowing in the 2024-25 winter season. Another uh, major agreement that we have in 2024 on the agenda is the master agreement between the City of Bloomington and Bloomington Public Schools. Mm -hmm. Park will review the staffing plan and make recommendations to Council. We plan to look at fees, facility use, maintenance, and scheduling of facilities, as well as payment for services and funding of programs and facilities. Next up is the naming and renaming policy. The commission has started to review um, some draft policies and make recommend or will make a recommendation to council. We're hoping that the naming and renaming policy will establish a systematic and consistent approach for official naming and renaming of all public spaces, including significant financial sponsorships as well as corporate naming opportunities. The commission will make sure that given names are consistent with the values and the character of the area served, as well as ensuring that there's key criteria for determining a commemorative name are met. Finally, for 2024, the commission will continue to stay engaged in the Bryant and Trepa Park's final design. We've been so involved throughout the whole process. We're really excited to see these parks in their final stages and the reopening to the park uh, to the public and come to life in 2024 as well as 2025. All right, so all of this work could not be done without the entire commission as well as staff. So a huge thank you to all of our commission um, and those who couldn't be here tonight. So Andy Hoffman, our vice chair, Nicole, Nicole Abraham, Daryl Eager, Chris Fleck, Hanine Curdy and Jonathan Minx. And a special shout out to the staff as well. They have been tremendous support and guidance for the entire commission this year. We're so impressed with all the work they take on, the thoughtful planning and how focused they are at engaging the community and serving the city of Bloomington. And that is our 2024 work plan and a little recap on 2023. So if there's any questions or comments well, thank uh, you madam chair uh, my goodness you're busy <laughs> very busy you've got here. a full work plan for the coming year and um i guess i'm hearing you're meeting weekly now is that's uh, maybe not okay never mind it's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, we could we yeah, could definitely <laughs> the look on your face told me no but other than <laughs> so uh i appreciate this is this ambitious and this aggressive work plan i really do and uh with the number and the size of some of these projects and the, the impact on a lot of these projects, uh, I hope we can maintain this contact, maybe find time at least a couple times throughout the year to maybe have a, a touch point, bring you back in front of the council and get some updates and have a conversation back and forth about what might be going on and, and what, what the council is hearing, what you're hearing, and what the progress is on all the projects. If that would be amenable, I think we could try and get that on the calendar. I think it would be a good thing to do. Absolutely. Very good. Yep. Council questions, Council Member Lohman? And then Council Member Carter, Council Member Loman. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, wow, it's a lot of work <laughs> they're, they're doing here. Um, and, and to that point, uh, one of the things I am concerned about uh, with taking on all of that, are you at all concerned about the quality of the work? You know, the mayor kind of joked about having additional meetings, but you know, is there any concern at all with with the uh, the number of items that are there that there we'd see some fall off with that at all? Absolutely not. From a co commission standpoint, I'd say we've been really energized and excited with all the work we've been doing throughout the Park System Master Plan, and all the commissioners are very hunger hungry and eager to dive in and and do more work. We've really loved the community engagement projects that we worked on for the initial parks. Um, so getting out in the community and doing those engagement plans, everyone's really excited about that. Well, it's a parent with small children. I. Hopefully you'll be successful in everything that you do with those parks. And the other one here that I had, just one other question, is I know that in years past, and I don't, uh, and at this time I may look to you, and uh, we have had the Veterans Memorial as a part. I don't want to add any more work here. I don't want you to kill over on me there um, as a part of this. And I was curious, is this, is this now somewhere else? Who's kind of in charge of, of, of that, uh, that piece? Uh, Mr. Verbrugge. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Council Members, Council Member Lohman. Our uh, facilities manager, Christia Davern, is uh, along with uh, one of our civil attorneys, uh, the two primary point people who are working on that because we're at the point now more of implementation than anything else. So uh, we've, we've had to take uh, one or two things off of 
the Parks and Rec Department's table. Or plates. there's a lot of work going on over there. So I mean, I I even cringed when I even even brought that up. It, it'd be it'd be nice to get for the public to get an update at some point uh, uh, of that project and where it's at, uh, given that it's no longer uh, uh, at the commission level here. Councilmember Carter, good evening. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for the flexibility to join remotely. I am traveling for work, so appreciate this option. Um, so I just want to say thank you for all of the work that the Park Commission has done and uh, yes, an ambitious work plan, but all very, very exciting efforts. And I started um, on council and I think shortly afterwards, the, the Park System Master Plan was passed. And so it's really exciting to see all of this, um, all of what was in that plan start to come to life in an even more substantial way. So thank you. I'm also really excited about the maintenance plan um, for many reasons. So again, thank you for that work. I, my only comment was, um, you know, you touched just very briefly on the reduction in sidewalk plowing. And I know, and not this winter, but the winter before we heard a lot of concerns from community members about um, the need for increased snow uh, sidewalk snow plowing. And so I'm just wondering if somebody on staff could just describe that to ease any concerns that people might have that we would not be plowing kind of like heavily traveled um, sidewalks on public roads, but that this is more related to um, some of those residential areas that have sidewalks in the neighborhoods. Council Member Carter, members of the council, absolutely. Um, you are exactly right. And I want you to know that we have not even started discussing this project yet. And before we kick off the project, it will be kicked off uh, with the city council to get your feedback and your guidance. And then we will go back to the park commission uh, to determine any work um, on that initiative afterwards. So I would expect that uh, you'll be hearing from us uh, probably a little bit later in the spring uh, mm -hmm. because we want to use our um, summer programming opportunities to uh, do engagement with the community. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Nelson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Just a couple of quick things I want to touch on here. Uh, first, I just want to say thank you for looking at the naming, renaming sponsorship policy. As you know, that's something I've talked about for a number of years. So thank you very much for, for getting that in there. Um, one of the other things that I think is important for people to understand, these park projects, particularly Bryant and uh, Tretbau, um, are adding new amenities. And I know we've had concerns from people. I've heard them from people in my district, particularly related to hockey, that they went away. But the concept of the master plan is adding these new amenities. And when I look at this, we've got a skate park, I believe, in the plans. Um, we've got the bike skills course. Um, we've got uh, one of the other big concerns we've heard about is natural park restoration. And, and these are why we're doing these parks, is to add new amenities. Am I, am I missing some major things that people should be thinking about that, that we're going to be getting in the near future as a community? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. And thank you for calling out those new amenities. That was definitely something we focused on throughout the Park System Master Plan and in listening to our residents. Um, we're also really excited at Bryant Park that we will be adding our first all-inclusive playground. Um, so that will be a really huge one for the community as well. That's great. Last question. This one's actually more of a question, but the adopt a park program, which I'm really excited about. Any um, numbers or information about participation in that so far? I know it's new. Um, just I know there's a lot of people that want to get out and help. That's a great question, Councilmember Nelson, members of the council. Um, we kicked off the program. I'm going to say midsummer last year, so we probably had a handful, and that's just off the top of my head. Um, the program is focused on spring, summer, and fall, so we're really going to be um, kicking off the advertising and promotions for that program this year, and we're hoping to really hit the ground running with it this year. Great. So this year will be essentially the first full year we sort of had a yes, it will. soft launch, we'll call it. <laughs> Absolutely, that Thank is you. correct. Thank you. Council, additional questions? If not, Council, uh, I would look for a motion to adopt the Parks, Arts, and Recreation Commission 2024 work plan. So moved. Second. Motion by Councilmember D'Alessandro, second by Councilmember Mua to adopt the Parks, Arts, and Recreation Park, uh, their 2024 work plan. No further Council discussion on this? Ms. Mercer. Mayor Bussey. Aye. Councilmember Carter. Aye. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Aye. Councilmember Lohman. Aye. Councilmember Mua. 
Aye. Council Member Nelson? Aye. And Council Member Rivas? Thank you. The motion carries 7 0. Thank you very much. And thank you. Thanks for the work over the past year. I know you've been very busy, and I know this year is going to be even busier. So keep up the good work. Please pass our thanks on to the rest of the, the Park Commission members. And uh, Ms. Catry, if you could just pass our thanks on to the rest of the Park's staff here in the City of Bloomington for the outstanding work that you folks do every day. I most certainly will. Uh, Mayor, members of the Council, I also want to thank Laura. Uh, Laura has been on the Commission for six years. Uh, Andy Hoffman has been on the Commission for six years as well. Laura has served as the Chair for the last two. We could not have done the work that we've done over the past several years without their guidance and leadership. Uh, thank you so much for all that you've done for us. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council, for your adoption of this plan. Next on our agenda, Council, is item 2.2. This is an update on our public health workforce. Dr. Nick Kelly, our director of our public health uh, operation here in the city of Bloomington, is with us. Good evening, Dr. Kelly, and welcome. Good evening, Mayor, Council members. Uh, <clears throat> in front of you, you'll see a picture of most of our public health staff. Wanted to walk through a little background in front of a, a consent agenda for you tonight. There has been work happening for years, more than a decade, uh, SHAC, the Statewide Community Health Service Advisory Committee or Council, has been working very hard to modernize public health in Minnesota. We all want that incredible public health system that serves everybody in Minnesota equally, and doing this is one of the ways we can get to that point. That plan came up with a great framework in 2019. In 2020, they paused the work on that, resumed some of the work on that uh, towards the end of 21 with a joint leadership uh, team. The state legislator provided some funding to support that work. I joined the joint leadership team in 2023. And it really set this foundation for a set of standards that everybody in Minnesota can expect from a public health system. It's based on a national set of standards and with that funding from the legislators, we were able to do an assessment of where the state is in 2022. This is those standards. Um, so you'll see there's five foundational areas up top uh, our division does four of the five. Our wonderful environmental health uh, division uh, does one of them, uh, the environmental health. And then there's eight foundational capabilities that every health department in the state is supposed to be uh, fully competent and capable of. And that's where a lot of this funding is being designed to help get everybody there because we have a patchwork system. No health department in the state of Minnesota met all of those foundational capabilities, including the state health department. We have new funding coming in to help do some of this work. Uh, I say this is new, but this is all funding that has come before you. Uh, we have the opioid settlement funding, CDC infrastructure funding, response sustainability, which is the new uh, state of Minnesota annual emergency preparedness funding, foundational public health responsibility funding, which is new annual state of Minnesota funding, a little bit left of our federal COVID funding, and we have upcoming cannabis funding this summer. Gives you a little bit more detail about what that looks like. Um, all of this funding has now uh, come in through the process. Most of it is annual, so we will be getting the same amount every year. Um, and with our agreements with Adina and Richfield, um, you'll see the, the amounts on the screen are for Bloomington, Adina, and Richfield for the three cities combined. So knowing we were getting some of this infrastructure funding, knowing we were getting um, work that we needed to do to improve our workforce. We brought on a workforce consultant with some federal funding. They helped us come up with a plan to process this work. Our plan includes hiring nine new full-time staff um, and three temporary staff to help us with some of the COVID work, mostly recovery related. And all of these positions are, are almost fully funded through the end of 27. Uh, we estimate there's about $4,000 short at 27. So it's, I mean, almost fully funded. We have a four phase plan for this. Uh, our first phase is two supervisors. Then we have a, a bigger team. Those supervisors then get to hire some other team in phase three. And then sometime this summer, when the cannabis funding comes in, we'll be hiring a health educator uh, to do that work. This is mostly just so you can see what uh, we've done on our back end is we've been braiding and connecting as much of the funding streams as possible to be as efficient and integrated in this work. Uh, 
So to kind of recap, there's about just shy of 1.2 million of new annual funding coming in uh, for public health work. Most of this funding has very specific roles and responsibilities for it. One of the key things is it's not allowed to supplant um, current work. Um, so most of this is new work, new capacity. We have a CDC infrastructure grant that's gonna help us do some of that work, along with some training that ends in 2027. That was bridging some of that work. And so we will see a little bit of an impact in 2028 uh, from a, a capacity standpoint that will be part of those conversations that uh, we'll be having with the Diana and Richfield as we share those services. Any questions about that? Thank you, Dr. Kelly. Um, appreciate the information and appreciate the, uh, again, the, the aggressive nature, taking on a need and going after the, the necessary grant funding to, to make sure that we can fund those needs and, and provide the work for, for the residents of Bloomington, Edina, and Richfield. Uh, the one question I had, I noticed on your list of, of staffing positions, there were at least three that said uh, they were temporary positions. Can you elaborate on that a bit for us? Uh, Mayor, council members, uh, with that uh, additional COVID funding we have, uh, we did not want to hire long-term full-time uh, because it's time-limited funding. And so we're anticipating three temporary staff working through uh, summer of next year to help us with COVID recovery work um, and doing a various projects around that. Thank you. Mr. Verbrugge? Yeah, Mr. Mayor and council members, and we do, when we recruit those positions, uh, if they are temporary, we do stipulate that. So people who are applying for it have full uh, knowledge and expectation of what the, what the nature of the position is. Thank you for that clarification. Council staff, uh, council questions of Dr. Kelly tonight. Council Member Nelson. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, first, uh, great job going out looking for some grant funding, and I know that's an important thing for public health. Most of the budget is covered by grants. Um, uh, just a couple of quick questions, if I understood correctly. This cannot be used to cover existing staffing, and is that true even if we shifted their focus to do new programming with that existing staffing? Uh, Mr. Mayor? Uh, Councilmember Nelson, the... So for like the CDC funding, it's explicit, it's, it's new hires, not to supplant. The foundational public health is, again, not to supplant, bring on new. Um, there, we have moved a little bit of some of our existing staff around to build some of that capacity. So we've done a little bit of that, uh, but the bulk of this work is to, to do some of those foundational responsibilities that we're not fully accomplishing uh, to do right now. Okay, thank you. Um, second question I had, what are the tales of this? It's, it looked like there's a couple hundred thousand, there's a few temporary positions that the mayor just did. You know, what are we looking at in 27, 28, 29, that sort of stuff that the city is gonna have to take and consider in terms of its budgets? Dr. Kelly. Mr. Mayor, Council Member Nelson. So similar uh, to the most of our budget, uh, we're going to get solid grant funding, so we're going to get just shy of $1.2 million. Uh, we think that's a conservative estimate. We don't know the dollar amount yet for cannabis, uh, so we did not plan on using the full amount that we think we may get. Uh, but right now, our, our estimates is we'd be about $4,000 short in 2027, and you saw that about 200000 short in 2028. Okay. So similar to the rest of the way our budget works with we're going to have stable, solid funding that covers the majority of the cost. And as our staffing costs go up every year, that number, we're going to have a gap that we're going to work to cover and work through our budget process to do that. Okay. So just for clarification for us on the council, this is not the same as the fire department where we know that's going to end and then we're going to have to cover it. You expect this to continue, which is, again, and I was privileged to sit in with the strategic planning with public health a few years ago, and, you know, most of the budget is that way, and that has to be extraordinarily nerve-wracking. <laughs> so to know that you're dependent on all these outside places to get that funding, but it, we appreciate it. Um, my last question, well, actually, I have two more. Um, in terms of these positions, is there any more 
uh, process in terms of approving positions that the council needs to do? Um, uh, Mr. Mayor and council members, uh, I think that we may have a couple more that we have to bring through for approval that we have to get through the HR process for uh, what we call B7 process approving the, the positions. Um, so they'll come back and they'll be on the agenda um, because we have to add them into the compensation plan is probably the only thing that will come back to you in regard to this. Okay. Um, then my last question, I know um, some of this stuff goes to mental health, and I know there's a huge crisis with our students, mm -hmm. um, kids within, I mean, our, does this provide any resources to allow us to help our partners over at the school district with the, the issues that they're working on? Mr. Mayor, uh, Councilmember Nelson, uh, yes. So one of the new teams we're going to be developing, and you know, I'm happy to dive a lot deeper into that process, but we're going to have a new team that's going to be working on substance use, mental health, and well-being, and policy. Um, and so there will be a supervisor and a handful of staff just doing that work and working with our partners and having a lot more capacity. Because right now most of that work is other duties is assigned to staff. Um, and so this will give us some capacity to do some of that work. Um, and, and to your earlier point, this most of the state funding is in the state budget. So it's base funding. Unless that changes, it'll be there every year. Uh, Mr. Verbrugge, and then uh, Councilmember Carter, I see you there, and we'll get to uh, Mr. Verbrugge. You wanted a comment here, I believe. Uh, Councilmember Carter can go first. That's fine. Oh, Councilmember Just Carter. Summary comment. Well, thank you, City Manager. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, um, first, I just want to thank Dr. Kelly for his leadership uh, in this effort with the State Community Health Services Advisory Committee and the joint leadership team uh, that has been really helping uh, shift and transform our, our public health system across the state. And I will say, being part of the SHAC um, as our representative on council, I have gotten to be part of conversations and hear from public health leaders across the state, as well as elected officials, um, primarily at the county level, because that's how a lot of the state operates their public health services. And um, I just have to say, like, we have we have really good things happening in Bloomington, and we are very lucky to have the leadership of Dr. Kelly and our whole public health team here. Um, there are a lot of public health departments across the state really struggling. And so, um, again, just want to thank Dr. Kelly and the whole public health team um, and then I, I guess it's my question, and you alluded to it right at the end there, Dr. Kelly, you said most of this is now in the base budget, it's state funding. And I know that um, during the last legislative session, there was some pretty significant public health funding passed for local public health. Is that is that what this is part of as part of that transformation work? Mr. Mayor, Council Member Carter, um, yes. The foundational public health funding and the response sustainability are both uh, new funding streams. The One of the largest investments we've seen in the state of Minnesota for the public health infrastructure in decades. And we're hopeful that we will see additional investments in the future. Um, and I appreciate your feedback. I am very proud of our staff. Um, and I will just say the SHAC and the local public health association um, advocated quite a bit on that new funding. Um, and as uh, Council Member Nelson was alluding to, oftentimes historically in public health, it's just been grant by grant by grant with some state funding streams for things like WIC. And so this public health funding that is now in the, the base budget that will be ongoing is going to be um, really critical for public health. So just wanted to add that. Thank you for the context, Council Member. Council Member D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, good to see you, Dr. Kelly. Thanks for being here. Um, and um, I don't want to lean in on um, on Councilmember Carter's uh, time on this council uh, on this uh, commission as well. But what, what I'm interested in is the um, measurement and criteria for outcomes related to this. So you know, obviously, the, when we talk about, for example, um, health equity, or we talk about substance abuse, uh, we're expecting some kind of positive outcome. It, where, how is that defined? Um, are there requirements as part of this funding that is coming in from the state that we need to track? Um, are, you know, who's, whose job is it going to be within the public health department to do that? Can you describe that a little bit for us? And, and I mean, I'd love to know what goals we're trying to achieve, if, if any, uh, which I assume there'll be a ton of them, but um, anything you could help us with would be great. Thanks. Mr. Mayor, uh, Council Member D'Alessandro, uh, yes. There is a lot that will be tracked. Uh, 
good example is the response sustainability funding. There are eight red cap sheets that we will be filling out uh, on a regular basis, describing what we're doing, how we're doing it, and meeting some of those goals. Some of this is really a work in progress from the state standpoint. We have a set of a framework and some operating definitions. And uh, my understanding is that uh, the next SHAC meeting will have a new work group be informed to really set some really clear definitions and outcomes for what some of this work looks like. It's a, a, an emerging complex challenge across the, the country as people are trying to thread that needle of what's it mean to do this in your community with a, a national framework that uh, we're going to be on the, the front seat for. So there is a lot being tracked and we're integrating this into our performance measure process across the city. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. A uh, quick follow-up then for you. What is the role of Hennepin County and um, to some uh, other extent, maybe our Bloomington Police Department, for example, as it relates to substance abuse, what is the role of them as partners in those outcomes and how 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 are they participating in what we're trying to do at this uh, at, you know, do we have responsibilities to them or do they have responsibilities to us as it relates to partnering on those outcomes? So, Mr. Mayor, Councilmember Del Sandro, I'm, I'm assuming you're, you're connecting to the opioid funding, uh, which is where we're doing a lot of that substance work. We're working uh, <clears throat> very tightly with the council, or not the, the county, on that work. Uh, so we're partnering with them, coordinating with them as one of the, the public health entities within Hennepin doing that work. We have great relationship with our police department, uh, very frequent collaboration in that process. And so we're jointly approaching a lot of things. On the county end with the opioids, we're, we're mostly there understanding what they're doing because we're far ahead of the other cities in Hennepin County that don't have a community health board to do this work. On the cannabis, we're doing a similar approach. We're coordinating with uh, multiple partners within the city uh, the advisory board of health and then we participate in regular conversations with our colleagues in minneapolis and in hennepin to understand how they're approaching these things so that we're on top of that and trying to stay on the forefront council anything else mr Verbru uh oh i'm sorry council member loman you know, Mary, I do have more extensive questions, and certainly we can get together and talk about them. Um, and uh, you don't even have to answer this one here. I'll just give it quickly to you. I'm interested with the, the eight priorities that are out there w with this plan that you've laid out, and maybe there is a, a more concrete plan that's out there. When do we expect to, you know, eight to seven, get to a point where we'd be able to, to uh, you know, have something in each one of these areas that would be able to, you know, across our three cities be able to really help with those things or, or be useful uh, in that process. So that's my question. Don't have to answer it now, but I'd be interested to have that offline. Very good. Mr. Verbrugge? I think, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, um, similar to Council Member Carter's comments, I just wanted to acknowledge Dr. Kelly and the work that he does and, and all of our folks in public health. But as you can imagine, um, when there is this significant of an increase in the resources that are coming into the system, uh, being very thoughtful about how those resources are being deployed for maximum effect, Councilmember D'Alessandro. Um, I, I want to acknowledge the work that uh, Dr. Kelly did working with the team that actually came up with the allocation formula um, for two reasons. One, I think it highlights uh, how important uh, Bloomington Public Health is viewed as a partner for the state. And uh, secondly, I, I think it speaks to Dr. Kelly's credibility within the community. Uh, and you know, from our perspective, we just appreciate his advocacy for our Tri-Cities Consortium and making sure that we are always at the table and um, you know, being appropriately considered because I think this f the formula is very favorable to our three cities. Thank you, Mr. Verbrugge. And your comments bring up a question. Uh, the additional 12 people, where are they going to sit? Well, Mr. Mayor, uh, we have a lot of people who are hoteling and uh, we're sharing spaces and uh, we're going to find workspaces where we can. Um, so I know that's a work in progress right now. I don't know that we have a definitive answer just yet. So, Mr. Mayor, uh, with the, the support the council provided uh, to do some furniture remodeling in our building, uh, the nine new full-time staff will all have a, a cube space. Uh, we're able to do some efficiencies and improvements. Um, we will have a little bit of hoteling 
uh, but we are doing our best to continue to build on the investment the council has been making for decades. Thank you. Good to know. Thank you much. Council, this was for information only. We have no action required on this, so thank you very much, Dr. Kelly. Always good to see you, and thank you for the update. Thank you. Council, up next, uh, we have a series of appointments uh, for our, our boards and commissions within the city of Bloomington. And as we get into that, before we get into them, I wanted to kind of set the stage that we, for, for you, you know it, but for anybody watching and anyone here this evening. So last week, the city of Bloomington conducted our interviews for our boards and commissions for our 2024 uh, year. The city received 47 applications from residents, hoping to serve the city on the Advisory Board of Health, the Creative Placemaking, Human Rights, Sustainability, and Parks, Arts, and Recreation Commission. Uh, I appreciate the council, your work, because each council, or each interview panel included one current commission member and one member of the city council. There were four dozen interviews in five different rooms over the course of about four hours here at City Hall and we had one person describe it as municipal speed dating. And I think that was about right, because we went through a lot. Uh, I do appreciate, because after the interviews, the panels reflected on the applicant pool. We looked at the, uh, tried to identify the applicants that had the most valuable skills and experiences to make an impact on the commission that they were applying for. And I get it that the, uh, we had 47 applicants, and we only had, 40, or only had 14 openings, which means there's gonna be some disappointed people tonight who aren't uh, appointed. And I think it's, it's a good problem to have, I guess, but it, uh, it, I know folks will be disappointed. Uh, I wanna thank everybody who did step forward to apply for this, for all of our uh, boards and commissions, and encourage anybody to, to continue trying to serve the city, looking for ways to serve the city, whether it's in your faith community, in your, your kids' schools, with a sports team, uh, nonprofits, we've got plenty of folks who are looking for help there. Uh, it just It's very impressive the number of people who are willing to step forward and help make this a, uh, a community, an, an, what is it, a, uh, uh, enduring, an, an enduring, gosh, I, I blanked on the mission, my bad, an enduring and remarkable community where people want to be. And so very well done to everybody who stepped forward. Thank you so very much to, uh, to the council that helped out. Thanks to the staff and the commission members who did all the interviews. Thanks to um, uh, our folks and our co-ed team that put it all together. It was a, it was a it was a big operation. It was a, a big operation, and they did a very nice job with it. So with that, uh, I would like to dive in, and um, I'll, I'll, I'll take the lead on item 2.3, and I kind of want to set this up in this way, and I hope we can follow this kind of this template about how we introduce these and how we talk about all of this. So our Parks, Arts, and Recreation Commission, uh, the interview panel was myself and, and Chair Peral. We uh, interviewed 17 different applicants, and we had one incumbent, for, for three open spaces. And we, in our discussions, came up with uh, four criteria that we were looking for in our applicants. Folks who were community engagement focused, folks who were open-minded, interested in hearing all viewpoints, and big picture thinkers with a long-term perspective, because I think that's very important. And we talked to, two, as I said, 17 different folks, a great group, a very interesting group, a diverse group of uh, of skills, a diverse group of backgrounds, and folks who could absolutely help in a number of different ways. We did settle on some recommendations, and uh, so the, the uh, interview panel has recommended the appointment of Nicole Abraham, the appointment of J.C. St. Ange, and the appointment of Toby Pergers to all terms from March 1st, 2024 to February 28th, 2027. Those are the recommendations of the Parks, Arts, and Recreation Commission interview panel. And um, with that, uh, Council, I'll open this up for, uh, for consideration. Councilmember Lohman. Well, Mayor, it, it appears that uh, uh, your panel went through this uh, information. They've made uh, three recommendations, and uh, uh, I'm prepared uh, if we're ready to do that, uh, go ahead and move. Well, if, if, there's, if there's no conversation, I think we, what we want to do is officially do our votes, mm -hmm. uh, officially do the vote, but I just want to give folks the, the opportunity if need be. Very good. Uh, we have uh, in front of us the names of our, uh, the, the, um, the folks who, the five finalists that we thought would have the greatest impact on the Board of Commission. We've got our, our three recommendations. And so uh, we will have, Safa, uh, if you could call the, the roll call and we will make our, Make our votes and go forward from there. Absolutely. Everybody gets three votes. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Uh, 
I will uh, vote uh, per the recommendations. Abraham, St. Ange, and Pigors. Council Member Rivas. I vote for that recommendation as well. Oh, for Nicole Abraham and JC Anch. Thank you. Council Member Nelson. Thank you. Uh, Abraham, St. Ange, and Pegoras. Council Member Lohman. I'm going to do the same thing. Uh, Abrams, Oge, and Pegor. Council Member Mua. Uh, Abraham, St. Ange, and Pegoras. Council Member Carter. Abraham, St. Ange, and Pegoras. And Mayor Butsy. Abraham Pagoras and St. Ange. Council, I would move that we appoint Nicole Abraham, Toby Pergers, per, Pergoras, we're going to have to get that name down perfectly, and J.C. St. Ange to spots on the Parks, Arts, and Recreation Commission, the terms running from March 1st, 2024 to February 28th, 2027. Second. We have a motion and a second for the appointments as stated. No further council discussion on this? Ms. Mercer. Thank you. Council member, oh, I'm council member, Mayor Bussey. Aye. My apologies. Council member Carter. Um, aye. Council member D'Alessandro. Aye. Council member Lohman. Aye. Council member Mua. Aye. Council Member Nelson Aye. and Council Member Rivas. Aye. Thank you. Congratulations to our new appointees. And uh, a little bit cumbersome doing it in this way since we have to do it all by, by voice vote, but I appreciate everybody's patience with all of this. Item 2.4 is our appointments to our advisory board of health. Uh, Council Member Carter, I know you were the council member who are, was working on that interview panel. Anything you want to uh, say as we, as we head into the recommendations that were made by the interview panel? Yeah, so um, we also had some really strong candidates, and so it was a difficult decision. But as we um, prepared ahead of time, we decided that you know we really wanted to make sure we were focusing on people who um, very clearly stated their commitment to filling out their term. There had been some transition or some turnover on the advisory board of health, so really looking for people who um, express that commitment to the longevity that we need in those positions. Uh, we noticed that they um, that although most of them are quote unquote provider positions, many of them were people who may have had um, other other licensures other than an MD. And so we thought if there were a provider who applied, that would be a good perspective. Um, and then kind of the topic areas that we thought would be important to have interest or expertise based on the work plan of the advisory board of health uh, were around mental health, cannabis, and then housing. And so um, we did end up making our recommendations. So we are recommending Annabelle Kornblum for the consumer position. Uh, she does come with an MPH or master's in public health. She um, currently sits on the advisory board of health. So she had filled a vacant term. I think she was on for about a year. Um, and she um, comes with a strong background in housing and currently serves on the Bloomington housing action team as a representative of the advisory board of health. So. Um, she's a very committed and valued member, and so um, we thought that she would she should continue her her service on that board. And then we are recommending Dr. John Allen for the provider position. Um, I will just say, if you're ever really interested in reading probably one of the longest CVs you've ever seen, read his. Um, <laughs> he comes with a substantial background, not only having an MD but an MBA. Um, one of the leaders in um, like a. a I'm not going to say it right. He's like a GI doctor, but he's got so many awards and published papers and all kinds of stuff. Um, and he has recently retired and is living in Bloomington with his wife and has a really strong interest in population health, mental and behavioral health and cannabis and actually just recently did some training on cannabis. And so uh, we thought he would be a great addition to the board. Thank you, Councilmember Carter. Council, any questions of Councilmember Carter? If not, uh, let's get into the voting for the Advisory Board of Health appointments. Ms. Mercer. And everybody gets two votes here. Council Member Carter. Um, Hornblum and Allen. 
Council Member Mua. Corn Bloom and Allen. Council Member Nelson. Corn Bloom and Allen. Council, okay. Council Member D'Alessandro. There we go. Corn Bloom and Allen. Council Member Lohman. I'm going to switch it up. Dr. Allen and Corn Bloom. <laughs> <laughs> and Council Member Rivas. Allen and Corn Bloom. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, Mayor, let's see. Corn Bloom and Allen. I already had you down. <laughs> <laughs> Council Member Carter, would you like to make the motion? Um, I would. I don't have the motions in front of me because I only have my little laptop, so I have ah. like limited screens. But I would make the motion to appoint um, Annabelle Cornblum to the term, the consumer term, and Dr. John Allen to the provider term, as stated on the motion sheet. <laughs> I don't know if that works. Second, but. that works very well. And just to clarify, these are for terms from March first, twenty twenty four, to February twenty eighth, twenty twenty seven. You got it, perfect, Council Member. Perfect. Thank you. We have a motion and a second, I think, by Councilmember Lohman to make the appointments to the Advisory Board of Health as stated. No further council discussion on this. Ms. Mercer. Council Mayor, Council Mayor, Mayor Bussey. Aye. Council Member Carter. Aye. Council Member D'Alessandro. Aye. Council Member Lohman. Aye. Council Member Mua. Aye. Council Member Nelson. Aye. And Council Member Rivas. Aye. Motions carry 7 0. Thank you very much. Congratulations to our new members of our Advisory Board of Health. Moving on to item 2.5, our Creative Placemaking Commission appointments. Uh, Councilmember Lohman. Oh, thank you, Mayor. And I uh, want to acknowledge that the city had uh, won an award uh, for its creative placemaking uh, in the city. Um, and uh, this uh, uh, particular commission is working on trying to bring place, uh, placemaking across the city. Uh, and so that's going to be a huge initiative along with a number of other initiatives that the creative placemaking uh, was a part of here. Uh, it was, uh, this uh, panel was uh, with uh, additional two members who had only uh, served uh, for uh, about a year. We reviewed 10 outstanding applications. And uh, what I would just say is that uh, for those folks who did not have the opportunity to be appointed this time, uh, please, please do apply next time. It was a very difficult um, decision. Um, but uh, fortunately, uh, staff had uh, prepared and put us together in terms of figuring out what our priorities were. And so uh, we had, had uh, set forth around uh, trying to find a candidate with a business mindset and with the, uh, with the number of the initiatives that I didn't mention here and also with that creative placemaking uh, piece, we looked for uh, eagerness to try to bridge the gap of making contacts with connections with uh, diverse communities and uh, Bloomington Public Schools. And so uh, we had a number of uh, applicants uh, that uh, kind of fit those bill, uh, and those are the ones you see uh, in uh, front of you, the, the five folks. We had two folks that were returning, and uh, they'll bring uh, additional um, uh, breath and uh, uh, history uh, to this particular commission, and so we recommended uh, that those folks be uh, reappointed, and those are the names of Jamie Schumacher and then also Jessica Anderson, and then the uh, new person that we had recommended uh, for the slot was uh, Thao uh, Pham. And so with that, Mayor, uh, I, I turn over this recommendation of those uh, three individuals. And I got any questions of Council Member Loman here? No questions. We will move on to our voting for item 2.5, our Creative Placemaking Commission appointments. Ms. Mercer. Council Member Mua. Uh, Schumacher, Anderson, and Pham. Council Member Lohman. Uh, Schumacher, Anderson, Pham. Council Member Carter. Schumacher, Anderson, Pham. Council Member D'Alessandro. Schumacher, Anderson, and fam. Council Member Nelson. Schumacher, Anderson, fam. Council Member Rivas. Schumacher, Anderson, and fam. And Mayor Bussey. Anderson, fam, and Schumacher. <laughs> Thank you. Council Member Lohman. I'd be happy to make a motion to appoint uh, Jamie Schumacher to a term of from March 1st, 2024 to February 28, 2027. 
and then appoint Jessica Anderson to a term from March 1st, 2024 to February 28th of 2027, and also appoint uh, Thao Pham to a term from March 1st, 2024 to February 28th uh, of 2027. Second. Motion by Councilmember Lohman, second by Councilmember Mua to make the appointments to the Creative Placemaking Commission as stated. No further council discussion on this? Ms. Mercer. Mayor Bussey. Aye. Councilmember Carter. Aye. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Aye. Councilmember Lohman. Aye. Councilmember Mua. Aye. Councilmember Nelson. Aye. And Councilmember Rivas. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries 7 0. Congratulations to our members of our. Creative Placemaking Creative Place Making Commission. Item 2.6 is the appointment to our Human Rights Commission. Council Member Mua, that you were working on that uh, interview board, were you not? I was, thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I, again, just wanna say how impressed I was with how the number of applicants that we had. Everyone brought a great perspective and lived experience, which was exactly what we were looking for, was uh, broadening our life, lived experience within that <clears throat> commission, um, representing different perspectives within the commission, and then also individuals who were connected and in, uh, already actively working within the community, whether it was their faith groups, whether it was schools, sports, whatever it was, um, just having that connection to the broader community to bring those perspectives within um, the Human Rights Commission. And so as we continue to dive into it, we really wanted to also uh, ensure that <clears throat> our members understand the Minnesota Human Rights Act, um, have professional and lived experience, we're able to really um, strengthen those relationships and, and forward the work that we are doing here with the Human Rights Commission. And so out of those interviewees that we had, um, we feel that uh, Thomas Burns, Hussein Dahir, and Carol McDonald um, were really going to be the, the folks that would have the most impact uh, on that commission uh, to provide the perspective that we were looking for. Council, any questions of Council Member Mua? And to be clear, the recommendation here is uh, for uh, Burns and Dahir to be uh, appointed to a term from March 1st, 2024 to February 28th, 2027, and Carol McDonald to a term from March 1st, 2024 to February 28th, 2025. Just to be clear on that. Councilmember Rivas? Can you turn on your microphone, please, sir? Uh, what was the criteria in their background that you, could see, that you took into consideration to choose these three uh, candidates? Yeah, I think the, the biggest background for us was that um, interconnectedness already with the community. So the, the folks that we chose were already very active, whether it was at their church, um, youth groups, um, or um, supporting other organizations that supported people within the community. And so that's really what separated the, the folks that rose to the top. So it separated Thomas Burns, Hussein Dahir, and Carol McDonald in our decision was having that extra involvement and engagement within the community that would allow us to bring in broader perspectives. Um, I know a lot of times the commissions are a step to, to start getting that engagement. Uh, and so we felt like um, we were looking for to, to add that extra layer to, to strengthen the commission that we have. Thank you. Are you good? Any additional questions of Council Member Moore? If not, uh, let's uh, begin our voting, if we could, on item 2.6, our Human Rights Commission appointments. Ms. Mercer. Council Member Nelson. Uh, Burns, Dahir, McDonald. Council Member Rivas. Burns, Dahir, McDonald. Council Member D'Alessandro. Burns, Dahir, McDonald. Council Member Carter. Burns, Dahir, and McDonald. Councilmember Lohman. McDonald, Dahir, Burns. Councilmember Mua. Burns, Dahir, McDonald. And Mayor Butsy. Burns, Dahir, McDonald. Councilmember Mua. All right. So I would move to appoint Thomas Burns and Hussein Dahir for a term of March 1st, 2024 to February 28th, 2027, and Carol McDonald to a term from March 1st, 2024 to February 28th, 2025. Second. Motion by Councilmember Mua, second by Councilmember D'Alessandro to make the appointments to, this, uh, to the Human Rights Commission as stated. No further council discussion on this? Hearing none, Ms. Mercer. Mayor Bussey. Aye. Council Member Carter. Aye. Council Member D'Alessandro. Aye. Council Member Lohman. Aye. Council Member Mua. Aye. 
Council Member Nelson. Aye. Council Member Rivas. Aye. Motion carries 7-0. Congratulations to our members of the Human Rights Commission. Item 2.7 is our appointments to the Sustainability Commission. Councilmember Nelson, you staffed that commission interview process for us. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. And I, I appreciate um, all of my colleagues saying really nice things about the people that apply to their commissions, but we had exceptional people <laughs> apply to this commission. So just wanted to point that out. Um, this is a, a commission that is very active, engaged with the commission plus work groups, plus events and things like that. So really looking for people that, one, could meet the baseline requirements and two, had experience in different areas. Uh, there's a whole matrix of their different experiences to make sure that we have people with regards to energy efficiency, um, environmental aspects, water, water, all of those different things. So it's a, it's a tough decision that balances sort of the needs of having a broad base of understanding for this group. And that's how we came about our recommendations. The other thing that I do want to just note for everybody here, that one of the individuals that I'll be recommending um, had previously applied and not been selected. So please, if you don't and you do a good job, please keep going. It may just be that, hey, there was someone that had a specific thing that the individuals looking for or the opening that was available made sense for them to be there. But, um, you know, great people on all these commissions don't. Uh, if you want to get involved, just keep Keep applying because there are opportunities. So with that, uh, the recommendations from the group are for Alex Brand, Sarah Cobb, Binier Akare. So my apologies on the pronunciation. Council, any questions of Councilmember Nelson regarding the recommendations of the Sustainability Commission interview panel? Councilmember Lohman? Not really a question, but uh, just a brief, uh, I wanted to just uh, point out uh, and lift up one of my colleagues, Sarah Cobb, who's really asked a lot of questions and uh, has done a, a, just an outstanding job. And uh, I'm looking forward to if uh, this uh, body decides to appoint you uh, further to, to serving with you in the future. No further council comment on the recommendations made by the Sustainability Commission interview panel. Hearing none, Ms. Mercer. Council Member Lohman. I'll go with Sarah Cobb. Alex Brand and Biana Akara. Council Member D'Alessandro. I'm going to go with uh, Brand Cobb and I think it's Acharya, right? Acharya? Ah, okay, well, I apologize. Uh, Binya, I feel bad. Yeah, Binaya. I feel bad that we don't know that ahead of time. Maybe his phonetical spellings would be good for us. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. I mean, as my last name is terrible, and Miss <laughs> Mercer's getting a workout with my last name tonight, so I appreciate proper name pronunciation, but thank you. Thank you. Council Member Nelson. Brand Cobb Acharya. Council Member Rivas. Brand Cobb Acharya. Council Member Carter. Brand Cobb Acharya and I ditto Lona's or Councilmember D'Alessandro's comment. Councilmember Mua. Brand Cobb Acharya. And Mayor Bussey. Brand Cobb Acharya. 7 0 was the vote. Councilmember Nelson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I'd move to appoint uh, Brandon Cobb to terms from March 1st, 24th through February 28th, 27th, and Acharya to a term of March 1st, uh, 24th through February 28th, 26th. Second. Motion by Councilmember Nelson, second by Councilmember Lohman to make appointments to the Sustainability Commission as stated. No further council discussion on this? All those in, oh, excuse me, uh, Ms. Mercer, please. <laughs> Mayor Bussey. Aye. Council Member Carter. Aye. Council Member D'Alessandro. Aye. Council Member Lohman. Aye. Council Member Mua. Aye. Council Member L Nelson. Aye. And Council Member Rivas. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries 7 0. Congratulations to our appointees to the Sustainability Commission. Item 2.8 is our local Board of Review appointments. Uh, this was a bit different because we had two openings and two applicants. And I know that the applicants were. Um, uh, they, they were uh, specified, or they, they specified a, a specific interest in this board of a, a board of review uh, for the city of Bloomington. There, uh, 
I, I believe they came in for an interview, but I can't say that for certain. I believe they did, but with just the two of them uh, applying, uh, Council, I would move approval of appointments for Beth Riley and Mary Beth Workmeister to the local board of review. Second. We have a motion and a second by Councilmember D'Alessandro to make the appointments to the local board of review as stated. No further council discussion on this. Ms. Mercer. Thank you. Council Member Nelson. No, we don't. We don't. Oh, need I'm to do sorry. The then this we can just, just the, uh, go straight to the motion. Mayor Bussey. Aye. Council Member Carter. Aye. Council Member D'Alessandro. Aye. Council Member Loman. Aye. Council Member Mua. Aye. Council Member Nelson. Aye. And Council Member Rivas. Aye. Motion carries 7-0. Congratulations to our appointees to the local board of review. Uh, Council, I, I, I want to say that, um, I, first of all, Ms. Mercer, thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, there, there was a lot to go through, and uh, the voice votes on all of this with uh, Council Member Carter offsite. And I know it was a, a, a big commitment for the council as well to, to chair these um, or to be part of these interview panels, to review everything, and to, to come to an agreement. I mean, there was, there was a lot of hours put into this, but I have to say, this way of doing it is so much better than what we used to do. Uh, we're just looking at sheets of paper and trying to make decisions off into it. Thank you so very much. And as I said, I want to thank the co-ed staff that put so much time into this as well because it was not a small task. And one last thank you to all of the applicants, those selected and those not selected for, for putting their name out there. It's not an easy thing to do. And sometimes uh, you're disappointed, sometimes you're not. And I uh, appreciate people's willingness to step forward and serve their community. I really do. Councilmember Lohman. Mayor, do we ever, you know, again, thank you. I mean, we've come a long ways with this, <laughs> we've a long ways. Uh, um, do we ever send thank you notes at all to these these folks that uh, that apply? I'm just, just kind of curious. I don't know if there's a cost associated with that or if that's something we've done in the past, but uh, I just, you know, feel particularly moved uh, after this this last uh, batch of folks. Not that any other batch has applied has been different, but wow, I mean, these folks really it was a tough decision. I think a, that's a good suggestion, Councilmember Loman. A good suggestion. Mr. Verbrugge? Uh, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, I believe we talked about this last time and that we do follow up to let them know the outcome. Uh, and I'm sure there is some sort of a, a gratitude as part of that message. I'll confirm that with Emily Larson and make sure. And if not, we can talk about adding that in the future. You're good. All right. Thank you. And yes, uh, specifically thank you to Emily. I know she's, I don't think she's here tonight, but thank you to Emily Larson who does fantastic work with us. She is watching in the ether, so. <laughs> <laughs> we will move to item three on our agenda is our consent business tonight. Council Member Rivas with our consent agenda. Council Member Rivas. Uh, I move to approve. Okay. Council Member, we're gonna need your microphone on. Sorry. There you go. I move to approve the consent agenda from 3.1 to 3.5. 3.7, and from 3.9 to 3.16. Second. Got a motion by Council Member Rivas, second by Council Member Lohman to accept the, counts, uh, the consent business as stated. And so if I'm clear then, uh, Council Member Rivas, just so I'm, I'm clear on this, we're holding out item 3.6 and 3.8, is that, that correct? That is correct. Yeah. Perfect, that's what I thought you said, and I just wanted to double check. We have a motion and a second to adopt tonight's consent business. No further council discussion on this? Ms. Mercer. Mayor Bussey. Aye. Council Member Carter. Aye. Council Member D'Alessandro. Aye. Council Member Lohman. Aye. Council Member Mua. Aye. Council Member Nelson. Aye. Council Member Rivas. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries 7 0. Uh, item 3.6. Who held 3.6? Council Member Lohman. Thank you, uh, Mayor. Um, yep, so I hold, I held uh, 3.6, which is uh, uh, in cave companies, apartments, and daycare. Um, prelim and final development plans, CUP, uh, for 6701 West 78th Street. And um, what I'm going to do is immediately turn this over uh, to the city manager. I had asked the city manager to um, uh, uh, have a comment on this. Mr. Verrugge. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Lohman. Uh, this particular item, Council Members, uh, had some concerns expressed to uh, various members here about a uh, contractor or subcontractor associated with the project who may not have uh, followed state labor requirements. So our staff has talked uh, to uh, counsel for the applicant and uh, we've been informed that all the subcontractors on this project 
are in good standing with the Minnesota Department of Labor and Industry, and good standing uh, means that they are in compliance with state law. So uh, our expectation, I know it is a value of the city councils that uh, worker rights and, and uh, 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 the rules around uh, workers uh, are followed, both state law and our city ordinances, and that's our expectation for anybody who's going to do work in the city of Bloomington. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor. And understanding that this, uh, the, of the uh, critical nature of this, I'd be happy to, unless there's any other comments, I'd be happy to make a motion. I see Councilmember Carter. Councilmember Carter. Thank you. I just wanted to clarify that that's all like layers of subcontractors because sometimes it can be like a subcontractor of a subcontractor of a subcontractor. And I think that's usually when the problems. Like that's where they emerge the most. And so I just want to clarify, it's not just the direct subcontractors, but all subcontractors. Mr. Uh Mr. Mayor and council members, uh, we do have counsel for the applicant is here and I think he'd uh, like to address council as well. Mr. Coyle, good evening, welcome. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor, council members and staff. Good to see you. Uh, council member Carter, to your question, uh, there were a number of subcontractors identified during a recent meeting here at the city so we started with that list of identified subs, and we took that list to the Department of Labor and Industry and asked them to screen them, and they came back and confirmed that they were all in good standing. Uh, but in addition, uh, later in the week, we went back with a supplemental list of potential subcontractors that were being considered for work on this project and asked that the department confirm that their standing was uh, fully in compliance with state law as well, and the agency came back to us this afternoon to confirm that they were all in good standing. So all the names that we had previously been identified and those supplemental names have been confirmed to your city, city attorney as being in good standing with the state of Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you for doing that, that work. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Coyle. Council, are there additional questions on this? Council Member D'Alessandro. Do you mind if I ask a follow-up question of the council? Thank Please, you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Pardon me. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, is that a is that a general policy for you all as as you go through this? So, for example, let's say six months from now, um, there's an additional uh, contractor brought forth or whatever to potentially do some work. Um, would you would you do that same review? Is that just part of your process normally, or do we need to request that from you regularly? I'm just kind of curious about what the process is. Thanks, uh, Mr. Mayor, Council Member. Thanks for the question. It's a good one. Um, the evolving issue of, of workplace safety and, and workplace compliance is certainly important. Um, this process that we're doing right through right now, I will tell you, is novel. Uh, most councils, most cities defer to the state agencies that are responsible for those enforcement issues. The Department of Labor, Labor and Industry in Minnesota, for example, is our primary enforcer. Um, so it's not a normal requirement for cities that they would have the contractors identify who their subs might be on a particular job, mostly because they don't know, right? Jobs change, projects change, the availability of contractors to work on jobs changes. So it's, it's a bit of a challenge to be able to say, here are 10 subcontractors that we are likely to work with. Uh, there's confidentiality aspects to it that we want to be respectful of as well. But if there is a specific concern raised about a particular subcontractor or contractor, I'm sure my client and any other uh, company that would be before the city would want to know about that for their own best interest as well as those of the city that they're working within. So it, certainly if a question were raised in the future, as you say, six months down the line, we'd want to know about it and we would, we would dutifully uh, investigate it to make sure that we were working with folks that were in compliance with state law. Sure. Very good. Councilmember Nelson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, I might just add, not to that I'm in the same exact space, but I, as a remodeling contractor, um, we are audited by multiple agencies at the state level and have to provide information to our insurance companies and things like that. So we have to go through that process, make sure we verify licenses, insurances, all of those types of things. I don't know that it gets to Councilmember Carter's drilling down into subcontractors of subcontractors, at least at my level, but my understanding at the state level for large multifamily projects, they are required to do that by law in the last couple of years. And so um, this is a very, very highly regulated area. And um, unfortunately still, we have heard cases where people have slipped through. So appreciate the extra diligence on this one to give comfort to everybody. Very 
happen. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Coyle. Everybody comfortable? Very good. Councilmember Lohman. Be happy to make that motion again. Thank you for this extra step. Um, I'll move to approve preliminary and final development for a five-story, 208-unit apartment building and detached 11,000 square foot daycare space at 6701 West 78th Street, subject to the conditions and code requirements attached to the staff report. Second. Motion by Councilmember Lohman, second by Councilmember Mua to accept item 3.6 on tonight's consent business as stated. No further council discussion on this? Ms. Mercer. Mayor Bussey. Aye. Councilmember Carter. Aye. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Aye. Councilmember Lohman. Aye. Councilmember Mua. Aye. Councilmember Nelson. Aye. Councilmember Rivas. Aye. Thank Motion you. carries a 7 0. Item 3.8. Uh, there's two. There's two motions for 3.6. I'm. Oh, yeah, I didn't see that here. No, um, here we go. Yeah, it makes sense here. I'll go ahead and move. Uh, in the, oh, I'm. <laughs> It's on the second page. I didn't catch that page. Mayor, when you're ready. <laughs> Please. Uh, Mayor, I'll move to approve a resolution of approval for a conditional use permit for 11,000 square foot daycare at 6701 West 78th Street, subject to the conditions and code requirements attached to the staff report. Second. Motion by Councilmember Lohman, second by Councilmember Mua. For the second motion associated with item 3.6 on tonight's consent agenda. No further council discussion on this? Ms. Mercer. Mayor Bussey. Aye. Councilmember Carter. Aye. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Aye. Councilmember Lohman. Aye. Councilmember Mua. Aye. Councilmember Nelson. Aye. Councilmember Rivas. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries 7 0. Finishing up item 3.6. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Now moving on to item 3.8. I believe that was Councilmember Lohman as well. Councilmember Lohman. Yeah, Mayor, um, I held uh, this as a resolution for uh, budget adjustment uh, to transfer strategic priority funds for BTT uh, initiatives. And um, as, a, as a part of this, uh, there was uh, a recommendation uh, uh, for uh, a climate. Uh, we, we had declared a climate emergency in uh, 2022. And uh, as a part of that, we... Uh, wanted to, to, as a commission, put together a climate action plan. And uh, when a recommendation came from uh, staff with regards uh, to uh, that, uh, we had uh, gotten a specific number. And what the, the uh, commission had done is had made a recommendation that we increase the amount of dollars because what one of the things we wanted to do with regards to our uh, city's uh, 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 Climate action plan was make sure that we had the best and um, and, and the brightest uh, and the most comprehensive, and so we had recommended a, an increased amount of money uh, for that, and uh, and this amount that came back uh, in this particular request uh, ended up being two hundred thousand dollars less than that, and so uh, what my question was for staff was is this the only piece of this request uh, that we'll we'll have with this? We had a unanimous vote uh, uh, asking for additional dollars uh, to be made available um, and ask this council for additional dollars and uh, wanted to see if, uh, if this is the only request, if there will be additional requests uh, or because um, it was a pretty strong request and uh, I, I just want to be sure that I understand uh, how we got to this lower amount which was originally brought uh, to the commission and we had uh, unanimously asked for a higher amount because we were concerned that we weren't going to get the, uh, the best uh, climate action plan. Mr. Verbrugge. Uh Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Emma Struss is our sustainability coordinator, and she worked with the Sustainability Commission uh, to move the recommendation forward. So if you could share a little bit uh, about the commission conversation and the rationale for the $300,000 as opposed to the higher amount. Yes, good evening, Mr. Mayor, Council, Council Member Lohman. So last um, at our commission meeting, the draft memo that came to the commission included $300,000, which is what I um, uh, initially proposed given 
other plans that I've looked at nationally of what the cost would be. Um, as Councilmember Lohman stated, definitely there was interest um, from the commission to have a higher amount, which the language then changed, which is included in their memo of 3000 is the baseline. And to meet the highest standard, the commission feels additional resources should be allocated on recommendation of staff after further research. I did some additional research since that meeting without specifics of what would be, honestly, from all the conversations I've had with other cities, um, this would be a higher b budget to go above 300000 My recommendation is that we don't have specific reasons to do that, and we have a lot of things that we need to do with implementation dollars. So um, definitely hearing... Councilmember Lohman was definitely correct. The commission definitely felt that a higher budget was needed. Based upon my research as staff, I haven't found specific need for that at this point. But if we come down the line and we start this initiative and recognize that we're not able to do what the community and council feels is needed, then my understanding is that we can come back to council and request additional funds. Councilmember Lohman. Thank you for the clarification. I just wanted to be sure that that had not gotten lost because uh, I know the expectation from the commission is that we're bringing back uh, yep. you know, the, the highest and best uh, uh, possible thing that we can given the, uh, you know, the import of our, our climate emergence that we find ourselves in. Uh, you know, the commission was very concerned and wanted to be sure that we were bringing us the strongest recommendation that we could and I appreciate your comments. And with that, I'd be happy to make the motion unless there's additional comments. Additional questions, council? Councilmember Carter and then Councilmember Mua. Councilmember Carter. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So um, I had a question on this one too. I, I feel like we have talked about um, uh, various items on this list for the strategic priorities funding. And so it's not a surprise that it's on the consent agenda. Um, but I, the one that I was a little bit surprised by the climate um, change plan. And then I was also a little bit surprised on the food access plan because I don't think we've ever um, talked about that, and I think um, I mean, my understanding of the strategic priorities dollars is that they're the council strategic priorities, and so it would just kind of surprise me that we hadn't talked about it before, and it was on the consent agenda. And so, wondering if we could get—I know I did get a little bit more explanation on the food access plan ahead of the meeting, but I do think um, it's something that came up in the uh, BTT strategic planning, and it also came up in the uh, racial equity strategic planning when I was on that group. And so I think it's important for our community to understand what we may be planning there. Mr. Verbrugge. Yep. Mr. Mayor and council members, council member Carter, uh, you're correct. We have not had a presentation on the food access plan. Uh, we have had uh, updates uh, working on it in the BTT uh, quarterly reports and um, uh, if uh, we, if you feel that we would benefit by having uh, a presentation, we can certainly arrange for that either before we take action or uh, afterwards, and I would certainly look to you for direction on that. Uh, and if any of the others that are recommended here you feel need to come back for some additional discussion, um, I'm, I'm comfortable holding uh, most of the items over if you want more conversation with uh, the exception of the one that I pointed out related to the uh, joint uh, study with uh, the state on um, disparities uh, because uh, we have another action committing to that process and that is one that we have had uh, multiple conversations with the council about uh, previously. So I'll, I'm certainly open to whatever the council wants to do in this regard. I, I, per, I, I personally would feel fine um, moving it tonight, uh, again, because most of those things we've talked about, they've been part of past, uh, past staff presentations multiple times. Um, and because the food access plan is coming out of the need identified in two, two different community-based strategic planning processes, I'm definitely okay with that. And then the climate change plan obviously is associated with our declaration of a climate emergency. So I'm also fine with that one. I just, again, wanted to note that we hadn't had a discussion. So I do think it would be helpful to have um, a short presentation on, you know, what's being planned there for the food access plan. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor and council members, council member Carter, uh, we will have our public health team come back and do a quick overview of what the food access plan entails, the process and, and uh, outcomes. Uh, and I know that the sustainability presentation for their work plan is coming up 
mid-March, uh, and so we can certainly uh, make sure to emphasize this. Uh, I, I would note that this is largely staff work that's going to happen on the Sustainability Climate um, Action Plan. The Commission is going to be supportive of it. Uh, it's not going to take up many hours of their work this year. It's going to largely be a staff-driven uh, process, but they'll certainly be consulted and supportive, and we can talk about that again when they present. It will definitely be a community Everyone will be involved who wants to be. Councilmember Mua and then Councilmember D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mayor. I, I just wanted to make a comment um, to Ms. Strauss for just her, her due diligence and coming back and saying this is the, the cap um, with what I'm recommending. I think that just shows the, the work that our staff does and how cognizant they are of our budgeting process and making sure that we're, we're being just good stewards of uh, taxpayer money. And so I appreciate you for doing that and not just throwing a dollar sign on it and, and getting some, some facts and meat behind uh, your recommendation. Thank you. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Mr. Mayor, my questions were answered. Thank you. Very good. So if I can uh, just kind of summarize where we land, or Councilmember Nelson, do you have a question? Um, I don't really have a question. I just wanted to go on record that I would be in favor of holding the first two items over until we get more information. I just think as part of the process to be able to, for us to get the information as well as the community hear that information, I think is just good process. I know we've had discussions on the business retention program and multiple options there. We have had discussions on the hatch program, very exciting program. Those were all done here. And um, I know that we've already approved 3.10 for the other one, <laughs> so, which, which is part of this and I think is just a, a very um, sensible thing for us to join other groups in terms of doing that type of reporting. But these the bigger dollar amounts, that's one part of it, but I just, I would like more information and um, totally respect the work that staff has done on this, the commission has done on this. Sounds like maybe they're not in the same spot and I'd like to hear a little bit more about that okay. and, and, and get that information. So that's just where I'm at, but um, I think ultimately, um, just my last quick comment, I've talked a lot about strategic priorities these seem like things that are one-time expenditures, not things that should have been in a budget somewhere else already. These make sense to me, given what our actions previously. So I don't, I don't see that ultimately they'll be held up. I just think that process of understanding would be helpful before I approve $400,000. Very good. Any other comments on that, Council? Councilmember Lohman? I'm not going to restate it. I think, Councilmember Nelson, you've put forth a good proposal and I'd be open to doing that. Very good. So just uh, directing a little traffic here. So if I'm understanding this, council would like to uh, hold out the first two motions under item 3.8, the $300,000 for the climate change uh, equity mitigation and resilience plan and the $100,000 for the strategic, uh, for the public health food access plan for further discussion, presentations by staff and further discussion, while moving forward with the other three, the State Joint Disparity Study, the Bloomington Hatch Program, and the funding for the Business Retention Program. Am I correct in that? That's my understanding there. Everybody good with that? Council Member Carter? Yeah, I just have a clarification. So um, for those two items, when would they come back to us and would that cause um, like a significant delay in the work? Like, would there be kind of ripple effects of us not approving tonight? Mr. Mr. Mayor and Council members, I checked in with our uh, Deputy Finance Officer, our Budget Director, Kari Carlson. Uh, our understanding is there is an urgency around any of these with the exception of the disparity study to go along with the action we just took. Um, so I think that we can get the uh, food access plan presentation scheduled relatively quickly and then I just look at uh, Ms. Struss and see if um, we can hold out uh, uh, um, approval until March 18th, March 18th. When, when you're in for the Sounds work great. plan. Uh, that'll work just fine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I look to Mr. Verbrugge or Ms. Manderscheid. So as we make this motion, is there a way to make a kind of all-encompassing motion or do we have to make the three motions and then the two motions to hold those over? How, how, what's the best way to do this, Ms. Manderscheid or Mr. Verbrugge? Uh, Mr. Mayor and council members, uh, because we have uh, two separate funds that we have um, these going into, uh, two of the actions are going into the 101 general fund. 
The, the third one is going into the Port Authority Fund. We should probably keep those separate. So you could probably do two uh, and uh, two motions instead of three. But yeah, how about if we just do all three and keep it? That nice sounds clean? good. Council Member Loman, you're up. You're all right. Item three point eight. <laughs> yeah. So I'll, I'll, I think it's going to have to be three because I think we're postponing two and then we're moving to and then we're another another one we're. We don't need to do that. We could just let those ones fly. Okay. All right. So I'll let them just sit there. Okay. Councilmember Loman. All right. So I'll uh, move to approve the budget adjustment resolution to transfer 80270 from the 42000 uh, strategic priorities fund to the 101 general fund to provide necessary funding for the state joint disparities study. Motion by Councilmember Loman, second by Councilmember D'Alessandro to approve the funding as stated. No further council discussion on this. Ms. Mercer. Mayor Bussey. Aye. Council Member Carter. Aye. Council Member D'Alessandro. Aye. Council Member Lohman. Aye. Council Member Mua. Aye. Council Member Nelson. Aye. Council Member Rivas. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries at 7-0. Council Member Lohman. Mayor, I'll move to approve the budget adjustment resolution to transfer 50000 from the 4200 Strategic Priorities Fund to the 101 uh, general fund to provide necessary funding for the Bloomington Hatch program. Second. Motion by Council Member Lohman, second by Council Member Mua to approve the budget adjustment as stated. No further council discussion on this. Ms. Mercer. Mayor Bussey. Aye. Council Member Carter. Aye. Council Member D'Alessandro. Aye. Council Member Lohman. Aye. Council Member Mua. Aye. Council Member Nelson. Aye. Council Member Rivas. Aye. Motion carries 7 0. Councilmember Lohman. Mayor, I'll move to approve the budget adjustment resolution to transfer 45000 from the 4200 Strategic Priorities Fund to the P210 Port Authority Development Fund to provide necessary funding for the business retention program. Motion by Councilmember Lohman, second by Councilmember Mua to adjust the, uh, or to approve the budget adjustment as stated. No further council discussion on this. Ms. Mercer. Mayor Bussey. Aye. Councilmember Carter. Aye. Council Member D'Alessandro. Aye. Council Member Lohman. Aye. Council Member Moa. Aye. Council Member Nelson. Aye. Council Member Rivas. Aye. The motion carries 7 0. Thank you all very much. And with the understanding that the first two items in this uh, item 3.8 will be back in front of us by 318, correct? Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Rivas, for doing the consent agenda for us this evening. We will move on now to item. Uh, actually, to item four on our agenda are hearings, resolutions, and ordinances. And we have two things tonight. Item 4.1 we will start with. This is uh, our miscellaneous issues ordinance. And uh, planning manager Glenn Markegaard is here. Good evening, Mr. Markegaard. Good evening, uh, Mayor Boise, council members. Let me pull up the presentation just a second. So, council members, this item was last before you, December 18th. It's part of several ordinances uh, that were uh, kind of consolidated as the miscellaneous issues ordinances. The council continued consideration until this evening in order to further uh, review the best date to use in the ordinance. Uh, legal and planning staff have met and determined that date. I'll talk about that in a little bit. First of all, by way of background, uh, the ordinance involves non-conforming site characteristics and when they need to be brought into compliance. Uh, site characteristic, uh, you can think of that as anything on the site outside of a building. So things like sidewalks or landscaping, uh, fences, for example. So the code language currently reads that uh, non-conforming site characteristics must be brought into conformance uh, with current site characteristic requirements of the city code upon either redevelopment of the site or expansion of total floor area on the site uh, by 25% or greater. So that's a pretty easy math exercise uh, if we have an addition. However, if we have an addition of 15% in one year and then five years go by, we have another addition of 15%. 
Uh, there's the question of whether or not this uh, code provision is triggered. Staff has always interpreted it as being cumulative, so it goes back to the date of adoption uh, in terms of uh, figuring out that 25%. So what we're proposing is to codify that interpretation, make it more transparent. The underlying language would be new and would state measured cumulatively for floor area expansions on or after January 24th, 2008. And that date was selected because it was the effective date of the ordinance in question. So it uh, totally aligns with the uh, uh, past staff interpretation. Uh, so we do have two motions for you, one to adopt the ordinance before you, and then a second one on a summary publication resolution, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Markegaard. Council, any clarifications on this cleanup and language here? Pretty straightforward. If hearing no one, uh, Council, I would uh, look for action on item 4.1 this evening. Mayor, before we do that, um, might be helpful for the record to have Mr. Markegaard uh, discuss the, the past public hearings on this item so that it's clear for everyone listening. Thank you, Ms. Mandershad. That's a good point. Uh, we, this is not a public hearing this evening, but uh, obviously there have been public hearings on this, um, this ordinance through the years. And if you could just fill us in on that, Mr. Markegaard, it would be helpful. Yes, uh, Mayor Boosie, we did hold a public hearing on December 18th. Uh, that public hearing was closed and the item was continued to tonight. Uh, so there was a public hearing held on it. Thank you much. Council member Lohman. Then I'll go ahead and move uh, to adopt an ordinance clarifying conformance triggers for conforming site characteristics related to cumulative floor area expansions, thereby amending chapter 21 of the city code. Motion by Councilmember Lohman, second by Councilmember D'Alessandro to adopt the ordinance clarifying conformance triggers for non-conforming site characteristics related to cumulative floor area expansion. No further council discussion on this? Ms. Mercer. Mayor Bussey. Aye. Councilmember Carter. Aye. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Aye. Councilmember Lohman. Aye. Councilmember Moore. Aye. Councilmember Nelson. Aye. Councilmember Rivas. Aye. Motion carries 7-0. Councilmember Lohman, summary publication. Mayor, I'll move to adopt a resolution authorizing summary publication of Ordinance M. Motion, uh, what? Sorry. <laughs> ordinance <laughs> amending Chapter 21 of the City Code. Wow. Motion by Councilmember Lohman, second by Councilmember Mua for summary publication as stated for item 4.1. No further council discussion on this? Ms. Mercer. Mayor Bussey. Aye. Councilmember Carter. Aye. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Aye. Councilmember Lohman. Aye. Councilmember Mua. Aye. Councilmember Nelson. Aye. Councilmember Rivas. Aye. Motion carries 7 0. Thank you much. Thank you, Mr. Markegaard. Moving on to item 4.2 this evening. This is a resolution initiating, initiating the rezoning of parcels northwest of Lindale Avenue South and West 94th Street intersection. Mr. Ramler Olson is here this evening. Good evening. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Keep this to 10 minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, oh, yes, I'm sorry. I have to share my screen, don't I? Actually, I'm unable. Oh. I'm unable to share my screen. I'm going to pause that. Thank you, Glenn.
Well done, Mr. Marker. Good. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor, members of the City Council. Um, yes, this is a study item. Uh, well, there is a resolution to initiate rezoning of those parcels that were identified in the title, but this is in addition to that or parallel to that is a study item looking at uh, the rezoning of those parcels uh, northwest of Lindale and 94th and then some consideration of parcels that are southeast. So, sorry, one second, move that. Yeah, so the proposal before you is rezoning a contiguous group of 11 parcels northeast of that intersection. Um, and then we're requesting guidance from you all about expanding the area of rezoning to the parcels that are southwest of that intersection, uh, Lindale and 94th uh, specifically. And then, yeah, considering a resolution to initiate the rezoning of the parcels at that north, uh, northeast corner. Sorry. So this is a map of the parcels under consideration. They're kind of split up by color. Um, there's the par uh, those groups to the northeast. Uh, they've been grouped together by the owner, uh, Lupient, which owns the uh, six parcels up there between Garfield and Lindale with 93rd at the, uh, the north, and then uh, the site of the uh, David Fong's restaurant. To the south, that's uh, five parcels right there. And then we just have a a row of uh, parcels that are zoned B2. Oh, and I should have mentioned, these are all B B2 zoned parcels, except one, um, the one at 9340 Harriet Avenue South, but otherwise they're all B2 zoned, and those are all the parcels to the um, Southwest as well. Um, informing this, there's some background, I'm sure you're all familiar, but uh, just brief highlight, uh, the Lindale Avenue Suburban uh, Retrofit Plan, which was adopted in April, 2021. Um, uh, promoted uh, B4 as a an appropriate zoning district for the vision that it espouses. So um, that's why we're um, we're coming to you all to uh, see if uh, this rezoning to B4 would be prudent in light of the retrofit plan. Um, there was also some rezonings last year in September around 86 and 98th where we rezoned from B2 to B4. Um, if you recall, if uh, the image to the right shows within the blue area what parcels were rezoned last September. And um, what's interesting that's occurring at 94th is what uh, was identified at 86 and 98th, and that's the creation of a node, although fairly organically, um, we've had a few developments that are uh, giving birth to this new node at 94th and Lindale. There were, um, was actually started off in 2003 with uh, 96 units at Real Life uh, co-op and then 2021 Lindale flats that was another 81 units and then just recently approved and still under construction Oxborough Heights to the north at 125 units um, these weren't factored into the retrofit plan because some of these are fairly new and now we have new opportunities at the northeast of this intersection that you know in in aggregate create a, a node at 94th and Lindale so staff is anticipating that and trying to get ahead of it to steer development that aligns with the vision in the retrofit plan. And looking at the land use around these um, two areas uh, identified uh, uh, within them, uh, the, the no, uh, parcels to the northeast are uh, community commercial, they're guided community commercial, and those to the southwest uh, are guided general business, and it just gives a good idea of what uh, land you what the guided land uses are around those parcels and then you see the zoning on the right um, no, uh, uh, the, uh, zone b2 and again that one parcel uh, zoned industrial um, there are again a, a pretty mix of uh, zoning districts around it um, i guess i should draw your attention to the i3 parcel to the west of the southwest parcels that's where uh, ziggler is located so a fairly heavy industrial area, but nonetheless, we wanted to get your guidance to see if we should consider rezoning or investigate those rezonings uh, for those parcels to the southwest. Um, as I mentioned, the guided land use, general business, and community commercial. Um, community commercial is basically general business, but some larger scale service and retail uses. Current zoning as uh, B2, as I said, uh, it's designed 
uh, to provide a wide variety of retail and other commercial commercial uses essential to support surrounding neighborhoods. It does allow more auto intensive uses or auto oriented uses, which um, provides some of the reason why it conflicts with the goals and vision of the retrofit plan and therefore recommending B4 as that um, more ideal uh, zoning district, uh, which allows, uh, you know, a neighborhood scale commercial and residential mixed uses configure, configured in a pedestrian friendly manner. So uh, this is a table comparing those two districts, B2 and B3, or uh, B4, uh, B2, B4, sorry about that. Um, they're there for your reference. We can get to that in more detail if you'd like, but Nonetheless, it, it is there if we want to refer back to it. Um, something that's always of concern when we're rezoning is what are the conform or the conformance of the parcels under question, and if any not uh, nonconformities will be created with the proposed rezoning. Um, we didn't get into all the site characteristics of what will be nonconforming if the rezoning does occur. However, um, but it's easy enough to look at uses and. There are a few parcels that will that would be um, deemed non-conforming, legal non-conforming, if a rezoning were to occur. But nonetheless, it's worth considering uh, the status of of those parcels in question. Um, it's only three out of out of um, the, the number that's considered. Um, as far as engagement, um, we have directly engaged the the owners of those um, areas to the northeast, uh, Lupian and um, Fong, and. Um, the summary of that conversation is that they were receptive, uh, but they didn't provide any definite endorsement of, of our, of, uh, what staff is proposing, but nonetheless, they were, they were receptive and willing to have a conversation about it. So we found that was pretty positive. Um, and if staff were directed to consider those parcels to the Southwest, we would engage in the same type of, of, uh, outreach, um, uh, uh, inter interfacing directly with those pr property owners and explaining the proposal and uh, getting from them what their what their plans are for the future and if it meshes well with what staff is proposing. Um, Planning Commission reviewed this on January 18th. Uh, there was unanimous unanimous support for rezoning the parcels northeast of that intersection, Lindale and 94th, and they also unanimous, unanimously. St uh, uh, supported studying the rezoning of those parcels to the southwest. Uh, um, however, you should know that staff considers those parcels to the northeast a priority, and the ones to the southwest a lower priority. The ones to the northeast, those have high development potential, so we wanted to get ahead of that with this rezoning, so that's why we're coming to you tonight with the proposal that we have. Uh, next steps, um, uh, it, yeah, so we're, I'll, I'll uh, considering a resolution to initiate rezoning tonight. And if that were to go forward um, and if staff or if, sorry, city council were to support the, the rezoning, uh, we would bring that uh, to a public hearing in March or April. Uh, here's resol uh, recommended resolution language to initiate that rezoning. If you want to refer to that, uh, otherwise I can take any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Ramler Olson. Council questions here. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I apologize. I don't have it off the top of my head, so I'm going to ask you to have it off the top of your head instead, which is not fair. Um, I'm curious, um, can, you can you, at a very high level, just give us um, a slight understanding of, like, the, the uses, the permitted uses and the conditional uses that are different between B4 and B2? Uh, for example, um, if somebody wanted to develop a restaurant where Fong's is, right, because they've got that building for sale, if we converted it to B4, would they still be able to do that? Um, or is that are, are we removing that as a permitted use given the, given the um, um, use cases for each of these? I'm just looking for a couple of scenarios to understand what the impact might be uh, from a permitted and conditional use perspective. Uh, Mayor... Uh uh, council member D'Alessandro. the uh so let's go back to that map so right now uh this is actually the conformance with uh the b4 district so uh the restaurant uh, on the fong site would um that's just the use though i i need to yeah i should probably emphasize that that is just the use um uh, haven't done the analysis to see if it would comply with all of the b4 standards but nonetheless the use does comply. 
There is an auto dealership at that north uh, west corner um, that consumes those two parcels. And then there's a auto repair place at the very south of the southwest parcels. So that's why they were har- um, highlighted for not being in conformance with the B4 district. But nonetheless, if the rezoning, again, again to, to, reiter- no, to reiterate, if the rezoning were to occur, they would be able to continue indefinitely as a legal nonconforming use. Thank you. Appreciate it. Additional questions? Councilmember Lohman? Thank you, Mayor. Um, so just I, I had a chance to kind of whip out the, uh, the Lindale Suburban Retrofit Plan. And, um, you know, I, I noticed there there really isn't, you know, and you, you have already stated this, that there really wasn't a plan there. But, you know, given that there isn't a plan there, you know, with this uh, in mind, um, you know, is there, a, is there a similar node that we, we should be using as our guidance you know, for, for making that change. And I guess my, my, my real question is why B4 and not something else, you know, in terms of that, cause it seems like a lot of our zones that we have, you know, in the retrofit, we're, we're moving to that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, and, and I get the, the short term B2 to B4 is a little bit less, but you know, if we're trying to be visionary in terms of this area, I just want to be sure that we're not overpopulating with one zone and then having to make another zoning change later on. And so I just want to be sure that we're, we're making a good long-term decision as opposed to just a short-term decision. Uh, Mayor, uh, Council Member Lohman, the choice to continue with B4, um, I, I don't have the, um, the, the recollection of how the, or I, I just wasn't there to experience the creation of the retrofit plan, but I believe B4 was arrived at because it was most, it was more, most suitable for Lindale. We do have other districts that have more in, uh, intensity, but I would have to, defer to uh, the planning manager, Mark Guard, to provide some of that history as to why B4 was landed on, um, other than the reasons stated within the uh, retrofit plan. But um, uh, um, are there any other nodes you mentioned, or you asked if there were any other nodes? Are you are you referring to as like a model that we well, should we've be? got nodes identified in the retrofit plan. Mm-hmm. And so what I want to you know, I'm kind of looking for is can you can you give me a, a guide post that I might utilize? Uh, you know, one of the other nodes that we were trying to we we're trying to aim towards. You know, at, at, you know that I might say, okay, yeah, we, we're trying to go in this direction, and maybe there isn't one, right? I mean, um, but I'm just kind of uh, kind of curious about those two things. Uh, yeah, Mayor uh, uh, Council Member Loman, the two other nodes, 86th and 98th, those are probably the best guides that we have. Um, if there's anything with over. Um, Anything even off Lindale that might be of uh, a roadmap, um, I'm I'm not really sure, but uh, we're we're just uh, we, we are modeling it off of the the rezoning and the, the development around 98th and 86, and we're we're seeing that kind of energy at 94th and Lindale. But as for uh, the B4 zoning, I'll let Glenn talk. Uh, uh, Mayor Bussey, Councilmember Lowman. In terms of comparable nodes, certainly France and Old Chocopee jumps to mind as one where at least three of the four corners have been developed under the B4 standards. So a lot of what that does is require buildings close to the street, uh, parking to the side or rear. And in terms of uses, uh, probably the biggest change is that it allows residential, whereas B2 does not. And then it prohibits some of the more uh, auto-oriented uses such as car washes or gas stations, uh, auto repair. Those are probably the biggest differences. If you could, could you go back? There, there was another map that uh, showed the entire area and I think encompassed the... Uh, right, oh, you passed it. Oh, no, one more. One more. <laughs> now where did it go now? Oh, no. Okay, hold on. In, in I'm going to go really the, slow. There, that one. That's oh, the one. Apologies. That's the one. Um, so the thing that caught my eye on this one, and maybe it's just the way I'm looking at it, is the guided land use of right away, the, the train track through there, and then to have it actually officially zoned uh, under you know, the, the, the zoning. How does that... 
how does that railroad right away? I mean, which literally bisects a good chunk of the work that we're trying to accomplish on, on Lindale Avenue and, and over there. How do we, how do we deal with that? How do we work either around or with or through that? Um, I mean, it, it, it cuts the, it cuts the parcels right in half. Yeah. It's a big theoretical question for you, Glenn. Yeah. What do you got? It's a <laughs> Mayor Bussey, uh, certainly it's both a amenity for the area in terms of the industrial uses and the advantage that they take of that uh, railroad line, um, but it also creates problems in terms of uh, noise, although it's not a very busy line, and certainly, as you mentioned, kind of bisecting some parcels. Um, yeah, it... it uh, in some of our comprehensive plan documents, I mean, there's the long range, super long range vision that maybe it becomes either uh, rails to trails at some point in the future or uh, transit corridor. Uh, however, we think that's very, very far out. The industrial area is very strong and certainly utilizes that uh, rail corridor quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So I think it's here for quite a few decades yet. And I'm afraid you're right. I think it's. Uh I've always loved the idea of the rails to trails to connect the entire city basically right through the middle of it to, to have a, a a biking and walking trail through the middle of the city as opposed to railroad tracks I think would be fantastic but I agree we're we're a few years out on that more than a few years out so council additional questions comments on this hearing none thank you gentlemen thanks for the presentation council I would uh, if we do not have any additional comments on that, I look for action on item 4.2 this evening. Happy to make the motion. Councilmember Member D'Alessandro. Yeah. Uh, I will move to adopt a resolution initiating rezoning of parcels located at the northeast corner of Lindell Avenue and West 94th Street as depicted in the resolution from B2 to B4. Second. A motion by Council Member D'Alessandro, second by Council Member Carter to uh, initiate the rezoning of parcels located in the northwest corner of Lindale Avenue and West 94th Street as depicted. No further council discussion on this? Ms. Mercer. Mayor Bussey. Aye. <clears throat> council Member Carter. Aye. Council Member D'Alessandro. Aye. Council Member Lohman. Aye. Council Member Mua. Aye. Council Member Nelson. Aye. And Council Member Rivas. Aye. Motion carries 7 0. Thank you very much. We will move on to item five on our agenda, our organizational business. We have three study items. Uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, all planning related. We're, we're meeting most of the planning staff tonight, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, this first one, item 5.1, is the Environmental Standards Review for Low Density Residential. Michelle Lincoln from our planning staff is with us. Good evening. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. I am pleased to present my work to you about the Environmental Standards Review. Just going to share my screen. Hmm. One moment, sorry. There we go. As you may have seen in the staff report, there's kind of a lot to cover. So in the interest of time, I may be moving quickly, um, but I will definitely leave room to for more discussion and questions at the end so we can go and revisit things in more detail after the presentation. So I'll be going through a little bit of my background and methodology um, of the project. I will go over the natural features and environmental land use standards, uh, focusing primarily on high level details about the feature themselves and then also uh, just focusing on the recommendations that came from planning commission and staff. And then there will be a time for summary and questions at the end. So this developed from considerations of the single and two family amendments adopted in May and of last year, and then they were added to the 2023 Com Planning Commission work plan after that. Um, initially, there were four items on the project to review, and the three that ended up in the report are trees, slopes, and wildlife and habitat. Native and natural landscaping is being developed in detail with Public Works and the Sustainability Commission. Um, so those uh, discussion around those topics will be coming later. 
So to conduct the standards review, I consulted multiple resources and research, looked at uh, sister cities, um, conducted some public engagement, and also performed some Bloomington-specific analysis and mapping. Um, so this is uh, the methods that I took in order to get to the report and presentation that I'm giving to you today. This is a, a recreation of table one in the report. This is just to kind of so, show the different interventions that the city uses in order to uh, protect our environmental features. Um, this covers 18, this is non-exhaustive. Some of these are broad topics, so there's even more specific interventions under each of them. Uh, the city has a fairly comprehensive um, planning and, or excuse me, interventions for environmental features uh, for low density residential and beyond. So in reviewing these in, in these items, um, I will be asking for direction uh, when getting in these specifics from the council um, on which direction we should go next um, for these and which would eventually go to code amendments, public hearing, or further study. So here's the city code review with the three items. We have tree preservation, steep slope protections, and wildlife and habitat. Um, all cities that I reviewed had some sort of specific tree preservation requirements that cover things like removal, reforestation, um, and protection of significant trees or important trees. Um, this is <clears throat> pretty common because uh, our tree canopy is one of the most important features uh, to help with things like urban heat highland, stormwater runoff, biodiversity, uh, our trees, and um, are just are really important anywhere um, on earth. Uh, but so you can see that represented in the city code. Um, also with steep slope protections, I noticed that I, you may notice that Bloomington is the only one indicated there. All cities have soil erosion and sedimentation controls. Bloomington has a very specific steep slope protection section, which wasn't present in the other cities reviewed. For wildlife and habitat, it's a pretty uncommon of. Uh, uh, topic to end up in city codes currently. We have a non-residential uh, conservation district. Uh, Burnsville does as well. St. Paul has RL, which is a residential district that does identify wildlife and habitat protection as part of its, its characteristics, um, amongst a list of other characteristics, but wildlife and habitat were specifically mentioned there. So this is the summary from of recommendations, um, and I've color coded it to indicate the discussion from Planning Commission. The things identified in green had majority support from the Planning Commission, and as well as from staff. Those in yellow had no majority um, from the Planning Commission, but had staff recommendation. And then the those in red have no majority support and were not recommended by the Planning Commission. So I will be taking you through the green and yellow items. So for trees, we have uh, just text cleanup with no regulation changes. Um, this just makes the code easier to engage with both as staff and as potential users of the code, whether that's residents or developers. Um, for instance, this is the significant tree uh, definition. As you can see, it's kind of a block of text. Um, I. Uh, present an option for amendment, which would be either changing the definition of significant tree and then amending it with a table. Um, and uh, that kind of breaks down exactly what we mean by significant tree. What are we actually regulating? What are we, what are our metrics that we're, we're using in order to implement our regulations? Um, another text cleanup would be uh, tree protective fencing is required before the issuance of grading or building permits. Here it's kind of unclear. It makes it seem like all grading and building permits uh, need to have this protective fencing uh, installed, but it's actually only when tree preservation standards are triggered. So we would amend the text in order to make it more clear uh, that this is not apply to all grading and building permits. It's actually in a specific, um, uh, a specific instance. So the benefits of making this change are improved readability, as I said. There's likely no new equity impacts because we wouldn't actually be changing, uh, changing regulation. Um, current equity impacts could be studied, uh, but we wouldn't be incurring new um, in impacts. 
based on these changes, and we would likely need no further study in order to support these changes. Uh, challenges is simply uh, staff time and resources uh, to make these changes, which are fairly low, and then also just making sure we align uh, definitions across and language across the code once we make those types of cleanup changes. So for wildlife, we also had <clears throat> one recommendation. Um, here I am showing the wildlife corridor map that comes from the Minnesota DNR Wildlife Action Plan. Um, this plan is considered a high-level document. It doesn't get as granular, at granular as uh, parcel by parcel for analysis. There's also not any um, planning or land use objectives involved in this plan, which makes it difficult to understand the alignment between this plan and land use standards. Um, and so, uh, but in order to represent kind of what's inside of the wildlife corridor, we have those in yellow are kind of our public lands, so parks um, and other open space. And then also those in pink are our low density residential. And then the remaining areas are things like water bodies um, or um, land that is not Bloomington specific public land. So it could be um, managed by the regional authority or other private land managers that have open space there. So the red recommendation would use the wildlife corridor in order to provide wildlife and habitat education for low density residential properties. This would be distributed two properties within that. Um, this could be uh, via the Bloomington briefing, so it would be citywide. We could get capture some additional benefit if others also take advantage of the information that we provide. It also can be adapted to social media, um, other kind of ways to engage with people. What also could be a great way for various events with community engagement to provide that information once we've kind of consolidated it together in material. Um, and then, like I said, it could be a low cost method by using uh, avenues that we already use to communicate with our residents. So the benefits is that it can be cost effective depending on the methods that we choose to distribute this information. It's opt in. So if there's um, impacts that could have a financial component like installing different landscaping or using different fencing types, um, the, the residents can determine their own capacity to implement changes, which could alleviate some of the burden uh, that a requirement for some of these changes could bring. Um, and also the resources are likely already available, especially like the University of Minnesota has extensive information that, can, that we can tap into in order to produce our materials. Um, challenges are that we would need to find the lead responsible department. Um, Planning Commission mentioned that the Sustainability Commission could be a likely lead for, the, for these materials. We did try to have a formal meeting with them. Scheduling didn't work out to have that meeting, so that work to connect and collaborate with them would still need to be done. Also, the time, resources, and data to pr could be cost prohibitive, but if we choose a cope, scope for that, those materials that can be easily managed, and also effectiveness can be under, uh, can be unpredictable, and we may not see results um, in the short term, but in the long term we could see kind of changing of the norms in order to implement some of the education items that we uh, choose. So in slopes, these are the items that had no majority from the planning commission, but as staff we recommend. Um, this is refining and adding the definition of steep slopes to the code. Currently in our steep slopes section 19.57.01, we don't actually have a de definition of sleep steep slope. It can be really difficult to implement a regulation or a metric if we haven't defined it yet, so that's the reason why I've included this in the presentation. Cities can have some discretion on what steep slope is, so I've identified three areas that could give guidance there. So state statute defines steep slope as 12 to 18 percent. The U.S. Department of Agriculture uses 15 percent or greater as steep slope. And our bluff protection overlay district, which is already being implemented or has been adopted, defines steep slope as 18 percent or greater. So there's some discretion there that we can choose to go with, but we would have justification by going in these directions and using that discretion, discretion, excuse me. So, and to kind of understand how those 
how that definition could impact the current landscape. Here we have average slope of 12% or greater, which is what the current code currently regulates, although it doesn't define a steep slope, but it currently regulates. There's a little over 1,400 properties, low density residential properties that would be impact, impacted. And this is outside of the Bluff Protection District. They have their own specific regulations for slopes. If we were to uh, implement a definition of average slope as 18% or greater, that would have an impact on 300, a little over 300 properties. It doesn't mean that we wouldn't regulate slopes less than 18%. It just means we are identifying that steep slope is this percentage um, and then could pave the way for additional regulations or we could leave it at the definition. It would just add, it would still add good clarity, um, but we wouldn't have maybe specific requirements with it quite yet, but it lays the foundation for that. Um, so the benefits is more clarity um, and it would allow us to actually monitor, evaluate, and regulate the applica applicable parcels. Um, and further in-depth study is not likely not required based on the examples from the state and federal level, as well as information that we already have within our code. Uh, challenges with making sure we have alignment, which can be very uh, easily done through a quick review. And it doesn't include any change to regulations on what we would do with steep slopes. So if we wanted to add those, that would be a separate project we would have to do after making these changes. So the second steep slope recommendation uh, or option is uh, adding some steep slope best practices. Currently, we have a impervious surface limit for depending on the slope that's on the property going from 12 to 30% slope. Um, and as you can see, the maximum cover is reduced as slope percentage increases. Um, some, there's some special provisions that highlight trees and surface water redirection as possible requirements, um, but it doesn't uh, give as much flexibility that is currently in our slope or excuse me, our bluff protection overlay district um, in cons consult with uh, public works. Um, these are best management practices, which means we don't require them, but they are um, uh, options that the city um, sees as beneficial or options that they could pursue um, that the city kind of co-signs. Um, they would still need to go through approval with the city, so they couldn't just be like, I did, I did, I covered my bare soil, we're good. They would actually have to present a plan that, that says that they've done this in order to actually mitigate um, the surface water runoff or soap stabilization. Um, but this just kind of says it more forward uh, that if you want to engage with steep slope protection, here are some options. And this is, uh, this is directly from the Bluff Overlay Protector District. And the strike through and underline, underline are my changes. So the uh, Bluff Protection Overlay District standards were updated in 2019, 2020. So they are likely the most up to date that we have. Um, these best management management pro uh, practices can give flexibility to property owners and developers who need to manage their slopes on their property. Um, and like I said, it would still be reviewed by staff. Uh, challenge would be that all, not all the language is relevant citywide because of how unique the bluff is. Um, but I believe that adapt adaptations can be made uh, and justified. So that was a very quick run through of the recommendations from Planning Commission and staff. Um, I can also go in more in depth in any of these items, not just the ones in green and yellow. Um, and so, Mr. Mayor and Council members, I am ready for your questions. Thank you, Ms. Lincoln. Appreciate it. Council, thoughts on this? Council Member Alessandro. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm, yeah, I'd love to have an understanding about why there isn't an interest in a tree preservation standards review right now, given we have a tree canopy problem, generally speaking, in the city of Bloomington. Um, I would, I'd be happy to hear, you know, maybe that's because it's happening somewhere else or whatever, but I'd love to know why folks don't think that that might be valuable at this stage. Thank you, Mayor and Council, Council Member D'Alessandro. That's a great question. So tree preservation standards, um, 
hold on, let me reframe a little bit, actually. <laughs> so in thinking about our tree canopy and all the things that go into um, having a healthy tree canopy, tree preservation is actually only one part of it. Um, earlier tonight, you heard about the urban forestry plan that's going on. Um, that's also part of maintain like or restoring or maintaining our tree canopy in order to have an inventory and a plan for our trees additionally they are um, uh, public works and city forestry are also working to really utilize our uh, public row um, using our public row to plant trees is one of the best ways to get new trees into our canopy um, and so they are working on that as well um, the tree pres our tree preservation standards are actually fairly comprehensive, especially compared to other cities. And with the work that's being done with the um, public works to add more trees to our canopy, um, those in tandem make a kind of are, are working towards having that like tree canopy of our dreams. Okay, if I if I can sum up, if that's all right. Um, so what I'm hearing you say and it makes sense to me, I think, is um, there's no need for the uh, for us to do anything in this area of, uh, of policy or code because we have these other activities and you feel that they're sufficient to provide what it is we're trying to accomplish if we were to go through some kind of tree preservation standards review. Yes, Mayor and Council Member D'Alessandro, that is correct. Okay. The, they're really working together well um, and our tree preservation standards are not a barrier or inhibitor to the work that the city forester is doing. Um, and also there are parts in our code that already prohibit the removal of trees in the row. Um, so the tree preservation standards wouldn't impact that. Um, additional tree preservation standards wouldn't impact the work that they're doing. It actually, it's already covered. Okay, so there's there's no concern that we might find ourselves in in conflict. Like, let's say the urban forestry plan comes back and they make certain recommendations, and will that will the, would would that potentially trigger us to have to come back and make some policy changes here? Without knowing the details of the urban forestry plan, uh, uh, excuse me, or urban forestry forestry plan, pardon me, um, uh, that is something that I can't say for certain, not knowing the details, but the likelihood of that happening is very low. Okay. Um, and also we we're, are, can work in collaboration with them as they're working on their urban forestry plan. So we could be proactive about any changes we may make before the final plan is released. Okay. Thank you. Others? Council Member Nelson. Thanks, Mayor. Hopefully two quick questions here. On the tree text cleanup portion of this, um, this is probably maybe for the city manager, because uh, there was something about the uh, building permits in there, and am I correct in understanding that we could condition a building permit on these tree rules um, because that's outside of the actual building structure? Uh, we wouldn't be prohibited because we'd be exceeding building code in that manner because it's outside of the actual how you build the structures. that. Ms. Mandershine? May I remember, um, Nelson, if I understand your question, uh, is, is, the, is the question whether we could use the building code to regulate trees? Is that? My question is whether the building code prohibits us from doing that because we'd be exceeding the, exceeding the building code and that's a statewide uniform standard. Ah. Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. Fair enough. Um, but I can definitely check it out and get back okay. to you. I, I, so I don't you, want to guess. Mr. Markegaard. Yes, uh, Mayor Bussey, Council Member Nelson. I believe you're referring to the interpretation and the state requirement that cities cannot have, uh, have ordinances or standards that exceed the building code. Our understanding of that is that it is limited to the structure itself and that anything outside the structure um, is not bound by that limitation. So tree preservation, at least our interpretation is it's not prohibited or restricted by the, that state law. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. I, I, I thought I had seen it the same way, but just wanted to make sure. Um, my second question, so this steep slope, um, if we add that into there, 
that doesn't actually change anything for anybody in terms of how or what they can build. It just adds a, a definition in there. If we wanted to actually change anything, we would need to come back and make subsequent decisions. Is that accurate? Yeah, Mr. Mayor and Council Member Nelson, that is correct. This is um, the, so the section is actually called steep slopes. And then we don't define steep slopes. So I think this kind of <laughs> brings that in a little bit into alignment where uh, other adjustments could be, we call it slopes protection or slopes, but we would need to define steep slopes as a first step before we got into discussing what regulations or requirements we could have for steep slopes. So this is um, providing some clarity on having a steep slope section and then being like, well, what is steep slopes. Um, so just kind of removing the ambiguity and then laying the foundation where if we wanted to provide additional regulations beyond the best practices or impervious surface recommendations that we provide, we're ready for that. Okay. Thank you. Um, and the reason I bring that up is I remember when we did the bluff protection standards um, that there were a number of concerns with people that have steep slopes in their backyards and that the rules did change for them. The areas that they thought they could build previously, they couldn't build. So I just want to make sure that we were understanding that if that was going to happen, we are going to change the rules for people. We'd have a very robust process for them to be informed about that. So thank you. Council, additional questions? Council Member Lohman. <clears throat> thank you, Mayor. Um, so when I look at the, the proposal, I kind of just want to take a step back a little bit to the kind of the the purpose in the, of the proposal here, and I kind of read, read this piece here, the city is protecting our precious environmental assets while addressing the needs uh, of its of its residents. And so, you know, you know, I kind of, so I'm curious about, you know, kind of the categories we got to for that. And then, you know, so I see trees, wildlife, habitat, slopes. And then, you know, I kind of think of, okay, so let's say we implement, you know, all of these different policies uh, with respect to, you know, for trees, it's a little easier. Maybe with slopes, you, know, you can have a beginning process and an end process, and you could probably, you know, by some measure, measure that that difference, you know, in terms of those things. And I'm a little more, um, you know, kind of concerned when I look at the, the wildlife habitat. So let me start the first question. Uh, I, don't, I won't throw a ton of questions on you at one time. How did we kind of get to these well, three to four categories, because then we get landscaping, uh, you know, on the other piece here. Um, let's start there. Mayor and Council Member Lohman, thank you. Um, so these were the, uh, these categories were chosen as a result of the single and two-family adoption, um, and that I was um, not part of that process. Um, so when the project was added to the 2023 planning work, or excuse me, planning commission work plan, um, those that scope had already been defined um, by the time that we got there. And I think that um, planning manager Markegaard um, can provide additional details. Um, my understanding is that those were questions that arose from a uh, public hearing and conversation around the single and two family. Um, and so those were the topics that we um, that I, I explored as a result of that. Thanks for the background and the reminder, you know, as to where this kind of came out of. And I just, you know, I just kind of wonder, this is more more commentary, you know, not necessarily free to answer. Certainly feel free if you want to. But I wonder if we were looking at this apart from that, you know, if we would pick these, these you know, these categories. Mm -hmm. Because I just... Um, I wonder if this really, then I, I kind of take a step back earlier in our meeting, we talked about our climate plan, because I, I see, keep wondering, are these really the things that are, are really going to kind of make a difference to that, that climate plan? And since we don't really have that in front of us, you know, we're, we're kind of working from, a, from another piece. And so um, I just struggle, you know, with, with if let's say we did anything on this list, you know, other than the, the trees and the slope piece, you know, how would we measure that as opposed to this, this proposal here that we have here? So that's, that's sort of where I, I'm, I'm kind of struggling with. Um, and if there's any guidance you can give me in terms of looking at this, you know, are these the categories, if you had a blank slate to, to look at, would you, would you suggest something else? I'm just, I, I, I'm not sure how to look at this. Mayor and Council, uh, Council Member Lohman, that's a great question, I think, because our environment is literally 100% of what's around us. So how do we choose categories? Um, so I think that um, 
if you can think about other really big categories that kind of exist in environmental protections, we look at things like water quality, which we already have, like we have our watersheds, um, we have additional like stormwater requirements that kind of speak to that. Um, and um, so it's, it's, that's a category that also has had extensive study and review actually over time. Um, so that's why it may not necessarily come up because it already has a lot of like regulation at different levels as well as um, more up-to-date engagement. And I say up-to-date as in continuous engagement on stormwater and water quality um, and the watersheds um, uh, uh, and in and, and partnership and, and the city in partnership with watersheds kind of handle things like stormwater and water quality. Um, and then also in looking at kind of like where planning can intervene um, in those things as well can get kind of um, like, it can narrow the scope of what you really look at. Um, if I had a blank slate, I mean, trees for me would 100% be on there. I think that trees are one of the biggest indicators for equity. I mean, who has trees and who doesn't? Um, and the impact that not having trees to habitat. I mean, a lot of a lot of other features feed into wildlife and habitat um, that make the biodiverse uh, uh, environment that we need for all of us to kind of thrive. Um, but in addition to that, they're great for stormwater and water quality. Their um, their roots stabilize the soil. Um, they help with evaporation off their leaves. They provide shade uh, to various species, including our own, um, and as well as mitigating heat island effect. So in air, we actually have an area in Bloomington uh, in the southeast um, that has, uh, if you have seen the University of Minnesota urban, urban heat island study, and you zoom into Bloomington, there's a really obvious area in East Bloomington uh, that has a high uh, urban heat island effect, which is kind of one things of like, ooh, that's, that to me says we should look at it. What are the trees? What's the tree situation like there? Because very often trees um, can be a huge factor in mitigating that. Um, so I think trees is a very natural addition to this project and, and kind of in review. Um, and the city is has a lot of different plans going on uh, in order to help with the tree canopy, as I explained before. Um, as for slopes. Uh, slopes, we, we have slopes. There are many areas in the United States that are pretty flat um, or effectively flat, um, but Bloomington does have a variety of slopes and hills and, and not outside of the bluff. Um, and so I think having an addition here of looking at slopes was fairly natural as well. Um, I think it, the issue comes, you know, a typical planning intervention is at plat and subdivision, um, and there are some grading and soil erosion and sedimentation requirements, um, but enforcement uh, beyond uh, beyond those um, interventions would uh, have a lot of impacts on staff time and then the ability for people to use their properties because it would require a lot of restrictions of not being on the slope at all. And, and as you mentioned, you're familiar with the Bluff Protection Overlay District and that discussion. And then wildlife and habitat is a fairly new kind of, um, I think, for people to engage in very deliberately. Like I said, trees and slopes are habitat. Biodiversity is very helpful. Um, but LA, as I mentioned in the report, has been on a decade-long process of figuring out how to implement uh, land use policy that supports wildlife and habitat. Um, and they're still not finished, but they took seven years with consultants to gather the data necessary in order to get to their draft ordinance. So I think to clear some of your confusion or, or insurity about like what's next, what do we do with these categories that we've chosen, um, it involves significantly more study, I think. So let me just say this last thing here. Mm -hmm. um, I get the trees, get the slope piece. I, I think you could easily measure, you know, uh, measure those things. The habitat piece, so for example, we look at this green one here, the low density residential properties and the educational piece, I don't know how you would you know, know that you made an impact with that. I just don't know how you would measure that at the beginning and then let's say 10 years from now, 
I mean, I think it's a good thing to do, mm -hmm. but I don't know how you would measure that. And I just, you know, as, you, as we're looking at this proposal, so, so for example, the thing that you mentioned, you know, I mean, that is a much more encompassing kind of thing that, that would, you know, you could definitely measure that, you know, the LA study. Um, and so that, that's where I'm struggling with, it's just the middle part. The other two, I, I'm kind of there, but I, I just, I, I can't make this make sense, the, the middle part, so, but thank you. And I appreciate your comments, council member, because that was, I was wondering also about the wildlife and habitat piece of this uh, for a different reason. I think in, in our discussions about the single and two-family zoning changes, we talked quite a bit about wildlife and habitat and, and, and made a number of statements, I think, that we would look at different possibilities, how we could work this in and, and how would this would work best within the, uh, within the city. So it surprises me that um, both staff and, and planning commission, I mean, that some things that would seem to be I mean, can I say low-hanging fruit when we're talking about wildlife and habitat? Uh, low-hanging fruit of, uh, you know, habitat supportive regulations and wildlife supportive policies that, without going to a full-blown conservation overlay district, but some supportive regulations or policies for wildlife and habitat, that they wouldn't be something that would be considered. Uh, can, can you share a bit of what the discussions at the staff level and perhaps at the planning commission level? Mr. Mayor, yes. Um, so the... A lot of what the wildlife and habitat um, is covered in other areas, like to support habitat, having our native landscaping and uh, native and natural landscaping ordinance would be a ha habitat supportive regulation for low density residential or uh, tree preservation or tree planting. Um, also all of the great work that parks and rec and public works do in our public lands and parks, all are habitat supportive uh, uh, and and kind of signifies things like connectivity is really important. Connectivity of habitat is really important for wildlife. Um, having those multiple areas be addressed in these other places um, means that we are habitat supportive um, in, in, in those ways. Uh, there could be um, more habitat supportive things. The I'm using LA as the example because they are kind of the one of the the cities that have done the most work in this area and provided um, an actual draft ordinance for all of us to look at. Um, they did things like having uh, setbacks for fences, having fences that um, had uh, specific opacity so animals could move through them um, or under them. Um, and they that could be also be seen as both habitat and wildlife supportive. I'm recognizing now, or well, I'm recognizing the kind of enmeshment that doing wildlife supportive things, or excuse me, or doing habitat supportive things are also wildlife supportive things. So there is kind of a, an entanglement there that you can't really separate. Um, but I think that in planning commission's view, they were, were they expressed kind of two main things, which was the simplicity of the code um, and the practicality of some of the recommend, uh, some of the early recommendations that I got from my research, like changing fences or having different setbacks. And also in having habitat supportive regulations for that are broad, you know, citywide um, could create a lot of legal nonconformity depending on the direction that we go if we expand the interventions that planning or the city um, interacts with these things, if a structure is in the right place, a shed's too close to the property line, or removing vegetation, it, there's also that component of it. Um, so I think because of that complexity and because of the question of some of the um, practicality of it, in addition to how native landscaping trees slopes and other things are already doing that. They had decided not to recommend it. And as staff, I, I agree. Um, I think that we have like the landscaping supplemental policy. Um, we have um, potential opportunities to add uh, the educational materials for wildlife and habitat. We have our tree preservation um, as well as like I said, the work that's being done for native landscaping on low density residential specifically that make these additional things pretty resource intensive and that could be an issue to consider. Thank you, I appreciate that. 
Council, additional comments here? So this was, uh, there's no form or motion or, or information here or uh, action here, but uh, did you get from our comments from the, the council questions what you were looking for as you continue to move this forward? Yeah, Mr. Mayor and Council, um, I think that I am uh, definitely grateful for the feedback and additional direction, um, but also I'm, uh, the question is, is the current direction that we're heading in and that I am pursuing the things in green and yellow um, uh, supported or, or not on uh, not wholesale, <laughs> not wholesale, but in, in whole or in part supported. So that way I can focus our resources um, in a direction. Um, also, you know, there's always the opportunity for council or planning commission to revisit some of these items. Um, so a priority, uh, identifying some, identifying some priority um, items is also acceptable. And I think I, my, my summary might be given what you heard from the planning commission and then given what you've heard from the council tonight, I think you're probably headed in the right direction here. Um, or not. Councilmember Dallas Hondro and just Council a, Member Nelson. Yes, Mr. Mayor, just a quick clarification from my perspective on that. Um, I, what I'm, what I would, I would find with you all working towards the things that you've defined in green and yellow here. Um, I would like us to consider, to your point, Mr. Mayor, um, some more habitat supportive regulation. And I understand that we think that that might be accommodated in part by the native landscaping work that we're doing. And so I'd like to just ensure that we have a beat on that from a planning perspective and that that come, I don't know when that's planning to come to us. Uh, I don't know, city manager, if you know when that's coming. Okay. Um, but, uh, I would like to, um, I don't, I don't disagree that, um, each, each of us in our own backyards can do a lot from a native landscaping perspective to provide the habitat that um, folks need. But we, 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 also, we also have to seriously just understand that wildlife and habitat, like it doesn't move according to our rules, right? It doesn't. It doesn't use our, – our boundaries are arbitrary to them. Um, if, if, if I'm a deer and I'm in Highland and I want to go to Moyer Park, I'm going to go how I want to. Like I'm not going to follow this nice little line that we've defined as right around the creek, right, and said everything else can be developed and who cares and cut it up and, and whatever. It just doesn't work that way. So if, if we're going to decide as a planning department that we – don't want to provide some flexibility in these areas of value for habitat and and uh, support that with landscaping and trees and other things like that, then then that's a decision we make. I would not be supportive of that decision is my point. When I look at the the, the conservation corridor, I look at a, a large swath of Bloomington. It's not just West Bloomington. It includes the entire bluff areas of East Bloomington as well and everything. So it's a very big piece of our city. And it feels to me like um, it's an asset that deserves more protection. And that's how I've, I've – that's the lens through which I look at all of this. So um, this is a fine – start to the process. I, I would like us to keep an eye on the urban forestry plan and the native landscaping plan as ways and, and, and have a beat on whether or not we need to do more from a planning perspective to support those. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Nelson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, I'll be quick. In general, I support these. Um, the one area, the steep slopes, if we're not going to go any further with it, eh, I wouldn't spend the time on doing something that's not actually going to change anything just my personal opinion. Um, but the question that I, that I really have is, you know, this seems to um, dovetail very nicely with our sustainability commission. Is there a plan to work with them at, uh, as well on this? Because these are many of the issues that they're working on directly. Mayor and Council Mulder Nelson, yes. Um, there's already conversation with Emma um, Struss about this. Uh, we were just not able to formally meet prior to this meeting, um, but discussions, they, they know about this project. Um, I was briefly actually involved in the beginning of the native landscaping, um, so that team is also aware that I was doing this work. Um, so that uh, partnership will continue in 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 crafting these things. I think the hope is that if leading to code amendments um, or education, that we are laying the foundation or not countering the work that they're trying to do. Um, so this doesn't necessarily uh, eliminate 
further changes coming in the future to these areas um, as we adapt and create our climate uh, action plan, um, which typically those plans can take some time. But I think this is uh, the, the recommendations that I have on the screen here are laying good groundwork for those things to be built on in what planning is doing and the city is doing. Thank you. I appreciate that because I do think this is an area that many homeowners are struggling with. They may have a number of trees that are infested. They're going to have to come out. And, you know, candidly, what I've seen a lot in my neighborhood is just get rid of all the trees then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's the easiest solution. It's it's the least expensive, ultimately, than trying to pick take that tree out and that tree out. And <coughs> it's probably the outcome we aren't looking for. Um, and so providing assistance and resources and guidance to uh, residents and businesses that are facing that situation, I think is important. So thank you for working with them because I, I see that they're working um, in, in a similar direction. So thank you. All right. Thank you. Mayor, just real quick. I know we got three more items. Alone, yep. <laughs> I'll be quick here. Do here. Uh, so just respect with the wildlife and the habitat. I think, Mayor, you've stated it well. Um, in my mind, can you split those two out somehow, look at them differently? I just think that what we have here, um, uh, this one piece here is not not sufficient. I'd like to see something more than what we have here. So, uh, Mayor it. and Council Member Lohman, can you explain which items that you're saying to split out? So the, with, with the wildlife and the habitat, in my mind, I'm wondering if you divide those up and mm. look at them def differently, you know, separately, does that yield different results? Um, maybe not, um, but then also as I look at that category that's currently right now, um, that one item that there's in green, that isn't sufficient enough, you know, to, to, to meet what I think what, what at least this council member is looking for mm -hmm. when I look at that. So, thank you, council member. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Our second study item of the evening. Back to Mr. Ramler Olson. And this is our RS1 zoning district review. That's right. I am back. Oh, it's so much easier. So another study item, this one looking at the RS1 district, uh, discussing uh, the district broadly and then focusing on some of the development standards as well as the purpose statement for RS1, uh, bulk standards, environmental standards, and allowed uses. This, this is a 16 page report, so I'm gonna try to be as fast as I can. Ultimately what we're looking for is guidance on the changes to the RS1 standards that were recommended by the Planning Commission, and that will help us determine what to bring forward uh, for public hearing at a later date. So just the recommendations is really appreciated. As a review, um, this is the, you know, the, uh, the assemblage of RS1 lots within the city right now. Uh, we split it up into four different areas, and between those four, that's 116 lots. Um, we have uh, Forest Haven in the north, just south of that, Greenbrier, and then even so further south of that, Timberglade, and then a couple of lots. Um, all of these are west of Normandale Boulevard. RS1 intent uh, is to provide locations for large lots, single family development in areas of steep slopes, significant vegetation, wetlands, or in areas substantially developed as large lots in order to preserve the character of the area and protect natural resources and ensure compatible development through appropriate development standards. Some RS1 standards to, uh, to notice or, uh, or displayed in this table right now. The, the big one is the lot area. That's the one that was covered a lot within the staff report and within our analysis. So the current minimum lot area is 33,000 square feet. Some other lots uh, standards be are below that or RS1 standards are below that. But nonetheless, that's, that's a big one to pay attention to. Here we go. So splitting it up between what's recommended and what's not. Um, I'll go through what's not really quickly. Uh, 
and by the way, uh, recommendations from planning commissioners to be more specific. So not recommended is uh, changing the intro language to the RS1 uh, intent statement. I just went through that. Um, they were not, they did not recommend lowering the RS1 uh, minimum lot area from 33,000 square feet. Um, they were not in favor of removing consideration of median lot width within RS1. That's just a lot area standard or a lot, lot standard in order to determine um, if it meets the RS1 intent. Uh, they weren't in favor of removing consideration of steep slopes in RS1. Um, they were not in favor, or uh, they also did uh, not recommend adding um, a lots location within a conservation corridor as a characteristic. RS1 lots, that was in response to some of the environmental concerns that were expressed last year during a uh, discussion of R1 amendments. Um, that was a that was something that staff proposed, but they did not favor that. And they were not, um, they did not recommend removing consideration of prevailing setback of structures on RS1 lots. So again, just kind of getting into the nitty gritty details of how we determine what an RS1 lot is. What they did recommend was updating uh, some of the parts of the RS1 intense uh, section. Um, they were in favor, uh, they also recommended allowing two family dwellings as a permitted use, as well as allowing groupings of two family dwellings within RS1. Um, they recommended prohibiting institutional related uses in RS1. It was not conceived of as an institution district or institutional district that was for others. Um, so RS1 should be free of uh, that type of use. And uh, they also recommended using uh, uh, criteria that were developed by staff that would be, they would be consistent and they would be used to evaluate any sort of requests for rezoning to RS, RS1. So I'll go through those in a little bit more detail. Um, yeah, this comparison of the current intent statement and what staff has drafted based on uh, the feedback from planning commission. Um, you'll notice that, uh, so at, at the beginning, uh, we are recommending that there be a minimum of two of the following characteristics. Um, currently, uh, there is just an or uh, qualifier in that intent statement, which means that any one characteristic would qualify as an RS1 lot or a lot that could be located in the RS1 district, but we're advocating that, or not advocating, sorry, we are um, offering to you uh, that multiple characteristics be considered. So steep slopes, uh, significant natural and native ve vegetation, wetlands, or substantially developed as a large lot. So something to consider and that we'd really appreciate your feedback on. Um, Additional and uh, additional uses in those that could be removed. So, um, as mentioned previously, uh, we we are putting before you tonight um, allowing two family and groupings of two family dwellings in RS one. Um, we feel that that's an appropriate move because it advances the city's goal to add more housing and to add even more housing diversity to the the stock. Um, it would be consistent with the comp plan. Right now, uh, R1, the R1, or sorry, all RS1 lots are guided low density residential. Within that land use co uh, category is allowed to family dwellings. So we feel this brings our zoning in consistency with, uh, in, or uh, makes it consistent or consonant with the uh, comp plan. It's not inherently inconsistent with RS1 regarding resource protection. You can design uh, two family dwellings to be sensitive to those features that exist on RS1 lots. So um, that's an another reason we feel it's appropriate to consider it. And um, just as a background, uh, when we say groupings of two family dwellings, we mean uh, a minimum of two family dwellings within 500 feet of each other. That's what's considered a grouping of two family dwellings, if there's any confusion. Um, as for re uh, removal of the institutional uses, I provide those below. If you'd like more detail on that, I can certainly offer that, but those are related to uh, institutional uses and we feel that they're not appropriate for the RS1 district. So proposing to have those removed. Um, so rezoning recommendations. We are not coming forward and making any rezoning recommendations. We're, uh, we're not... Uh, uh, recommending any wide scale, wide scale rezoning. Uh, that would be uh, pretty burdensome on staff. It'd be hard to do. It might create a lot of confusion with residents. So we're not coming forward with, with that recommendation tonight, but we are proposing uh, five criteria by which to assess rezoning requests. 
um, consistency with the RS1 intent, uh, the level of conformity with RS1 standards. So again, evaluating a group of lots and to see if, if um, well, I mean, the level of conformity would be determined by city council or um, uh, yeah, the reviewing bodies, but nonetheless uh, offering that as a criterion, uh, the scale of the rezoning action. So how many lots are being proposed for rezoning? Uh, again, uh, we prefer continuity and contigu- uh, contiguity. So that gets to the fourth criteria criterion as well. And the proportion of neighborhood support. Again, what the proportion is or what the acceptable proportion is, uh, we leave that to you. But nonetheless, we feel that it's important uh, to have that sort of support for that action instead of a minority speaking for a group of lots. We want to make sure that it is a, a more democratic um, proposal. Uh, next steps for this item is um, based on this Based on this uh, study session, uh, drafting ordinance amendments, uh, uh, getting the feedback from you all to uh, incorporate in that into those uh, propo- proposed amendments. Uh, we'll be doing some engagement f- uh, about some of the, uh, w- concerning the proposed amendments with uh, residents of RS1 lots, uh, uh, updating our Let's Talk Bloomington page and sending out letters, just informing them, letting them know that there will be a public hearing coming up and just making a special effort to reach those residents specifically. And then uh, public hearings most likely in April and May of this year. So again, just to emphasize or to to remind, um, we are trying to get uh, you know, direction uh, from you all based on those planning commission recommendations. I leave those up there f- for your um, review and reference. If you'd like to talk about um, uh, some of the options that were not recommended by planning commission. I'm happy to do that, but I uh, figured it best to, if we um, focus on the, what's being recommended by planning commission, but nonetheless, I, I, uh, I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you, Mr. Randall Olson. Council member Dallas Hondo, and then council member Bowman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I apologize. Did you, you had mentioned you were going to go through the five consistent criteria. Mm-hmm. Can you show them to me again? Uh, yes, Mayor, uh, uh, Council Member. Um, there we go. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That that that's fine. Okay. So go ahead and go back to that. I I tend to not have any problem with the recommendations that you're making, although the groupings thing is a little weird to me, especially in line with the not recommendation to reduce the lot size. Um, which which um, seemed to be a big part of what we were trying to accomplish before. And so I'm kind of confused as to like the the, the, the pitch here. Um, but um, I I actually think so my biggest thing here is that I this this notion that that we don't have a have the RS1 uh, is not used very often and it is intended to be, setting aside properties regard I don't care if they were 6,000 square feet like it wouldn't matter to me right so my point is I, I'm not gonna like worry about the lot size what I care about is its location its environmental ca- characteristics and things like that which is what the original intent was even though lots of people believe that maybe that wasn't what the intent was um, fine I, I care that this this conservation corridor thing means a lot, I think, to a lot of people, um, especially people who live in the area that purchased property in that area, in part because they got the benefit of being in a conservation corridor and therefore get to, you know, coexist with wildlife and habitat and things of that nature. Um, it it surprises me that we don't want to use that as a means by which to, frankly, limit in a good way the number of properties in Bloomington that could be classified this way, right? So, so we want this to be a, 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 an area of significant environmental value. And it seems to me having a conservation cor- a corridor, um, you know, a property within that would give us a very easy way to say it is or isn't eligible for RS1 zoning because – it is either in there or it's not, and we know what that looks like. Um, so I'm kind of I'm kind of surprised that that's not something people want to consider. Um, 
the RS1 intent section looked good to me. The two family dwellings thing is fine. We already allow it. We might as well just make it okay. Um, the institutional stuff that you changed and the criteria is great. Um, so um, I, I don't necessarily have any problem with the recommendations um, as much as I am surprised that we're not going to um, lean into, if you will, the notion of that environmental impact and assessment by actually providing something in the characteristics of the of the zone zoning code to give us that information. Because uh, it seems like an easy one to do. And, and without it, you end up with, you know, he said, she said kind of conversations about whether it is or isn't environmentally significant. Nailing it within a conservation corridor seems like an easy way to say everybody agrees because, you know, that comes from the DNR or whatever. So that's my input right now. Um, I think you did a nice bit of work here. Uh, but I know I know people will care to have people, especially who live in that corridor, who contact me, want to see us, you know, understand that this RS1 district is intended for um, for that purpose. Um, and it that's the priority. It the size of the lot, I know everybody thinks that's what it is, and it's all about West Bloomington and, like, big lots, whatever. I, If you so told me that you wanted to change the minimum lot size in RS1 to 7,800 square feet, I wouldn't argue at this point because I don't think that's the purpose of this zone. I think the purpose of this zone is to provide a higher standard of environmental and habitat protection than the regular R1 district. And Unless I'm wrong, but that seems to be what it says. So that's that's my take at this stage. Thanks. Councilmember Lohman. Uh, thank you, Councilmember. So I, I, I'm kind of thinking differently after after listening to your your comments a little bit about this. So let me just ask another question on the on the side here. Uh, um, I was interested um, with the idea that uh, the R1 with the institutions not being allowed uh, in that. You know, how does that work in the R1? So, for example, I know we've got some, if I remember right, nursing homes in there um, and some other types of uses there. So how does that, I guess I'm trying to understand why that recommendation was made. Is, is this going to be somehow different? You know, so for example, I mean, I've got, you know, in other places that are close, we've got, you know, homes for folks who've got disabilities and that type of thing. So would that not be allowed in this RS1? Uh, Mayor, council member, I don't have the, don't have the uh, use table off the top of my head. I believe yeah. we do have a broader use category of institution related uses. Um, institutions can also refer to school campuses schools. Sure. I mean, if that would be appropriate in RS1, um, my understanding of the history of that district, uh, or of the RS1 district is that those, in, those uses were not intended for RS1. You will see them, uh, 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 permitted in one fashion or another within the other residential districts, but RS1 was excluded from those, I'm guessing because of, uh, Perhaps uh, getting to Councilmember D'Alessandro's point about it, the history being of large lots and an environmental resource protection, and that being incongruent with establishing institutional uses within that district. Hmm. Yeah, I, I just um, I'd like us to look into more of that because I wouldn't want to be discriminating against certain folks, you know, who may, for example, who have disabilities and uh, would, would benefit from having those types of facilities and being able to take advantage of, of, of nature or natural resources that are there. So um, I hope we'd have another look at that. So it's in secondarily moving along here quickly. I've just got you know four quick things here. I know we've got more items on the list here. Um, is that I, when I saw the, the conservation corridor piece being lopped off of that, that raised all sorts of alarm bells for me. Uh, because I thought the very intent of what we're trying to do is around natural uh, resource protection. And so if, if that's offered as an opportunity, that should be included if we're going to make this as a separate zone. So uh, that made me go, mm, I'm not sure. That kind of leads me to believe that this really is something that we're trying to protect lot sizes in, in, in our more western uh, parts of our city. Um, so um, so that's, that's just one piece as I look at that that doesn't really fit with the narrative here. And then um, 
Uh, and this is the piece where I, you know, uh, in terms of what the, the, the previous council member said to kind of made me think a little bit more in terms of, as I thought about what if we were to offer a, another zoning district that allowed that, that lower level of folks, because I'm not sure I'm interested in reducing that 33. Um, but, you know, and I'll just state it this way, um, I'm kind of changing my mind, but I want to just put this out as I, I, I had written it. But uh, what if we offered another zone that went down to that 22,000 uh, that, that said that you had to do all four items that you listed um, um, on, on your uh, RS, RS1 piece? And then, uh, and then we'd make it more like the R1. Um, so um, I would be open to something like that, or maybe bringing the other standard down to the 22 and then also putting that requirement on it as well. Um, and then finally, um, as I look at those those consistency pieces um, or, or those five items that you had listed there in terms of the standards, um, the one thing that troubles me that I can't get around uh, is how these things do tend to be concentrated um, in certain parts of the city. And so I think that we would have to address that, that concentration um, of where these things are located. R1 is located, you know, pretty much all the way across the city. Um, and so um, whatever changes that need to be made, if we do, do intend to continue to have RS1, in, in this council member's opinion, we're going to need to make it more uniform across the city. If it really is indeed the intent of it to have a, um, a natural resources bend or, or some type of environmental uh, or component of it. Otherwise, it just doesn't, it just, to me, doesn't make sense um, in terms of what we're advocating for. Um, so um, thank you. Great work that you've done here, but those are my, my, my four either recommendations or, or concerns. Councilmember Nelson. Thank you, Mayor. My first question will be straightforward and direct. Uh, then I'll have other questions. <laughs> Was it considered to just remove RS1 zoning altogether and just put everything under R1? There's only 116 lots out of 20 some thousand single family lots. Uh, just my opinion. Um, it hasn't worked. And we've demonstrated that R1 does all these other things. I mean, most of these places that we're talking about that have wetlands, steep slopes, trees, wildlife, exist in R1 zoning. If that's truly the goal of this, we've demonstrated we don't need it. So was it considered to just eliminate this zoning completely and just go to R1, the use is single family homes? Mayor, council member, no, it wasn't considered. Um, I don't believe that was the direction we received, and so we didn't want to entertain that. Uh, of course, we're happy to get your feedback to see if that is a, a palatable uh, consideration uh, amongst you all, if, if that's something we should explore. But, uh, yeah, no, that wasn't something we had uh, thought of. Okay. Although, I mean, I, I guess I should say that, um, I mean, in reference to uh, uh, Planner uh, Michelle Lincoln's presentation, having these standards broadly applicable might speak to what you're talking about. If we have these standards that are looking at steep slopes, wetlands based, you know, uh, uh, no matter the, the zoning district, perhaps maybe it doesn't matter if there is a distinction between RS1 and R1. I mean, the, the most overriding distinction is the lot size. It's preserving large lots and a large lot character. Um, if it, uh, if we have the tools and the resources and the standards in place to protect natural resources and we're not concerned about lot size, then maybe RS1 is um, superfluous. But um, that's maybe I'm speaking too much off the cuff, actually. So I'm not going to. Uh, yeah, I, I will. I'm happy to take your direction on what we should consider. Thank you. And I appreciate the candor on the answer on why. And second, I think you said it way more eloquently than I could. I, I think that's exactly what we should do is look at those other standards. Um, one of the concerns that I have um, about this specific recommendation is to add, do the two family as opposed to allowing a lot smaller lot size to split. I mean, so basically by this policy, we would be encouraging duplexes at the expense of single family homes. Instead of having two single family homes, we would encourage to have a duplex. And one of the things that we've talked a lot about is ownership opportunities. Duplex, you can certainly be, you know, own each side of that, but they do tend to be a higher percentage of rental. 
And so it would, do you see that, that that would be an impact if we are encouraging two family dwellings as opposed to allowing a split and having two single family dwellings? Uh, Mayor, uh, council member, uh, I, I should have mentioned this during the presentation that it's not only just the, the, the building of new duplexes, but it's actually retaining existing structures and just subdividing within. So you could have what is from all, all intents and purposes from the outside, a single family home, but it's actually two addresses. There's two dwellings within that. Mm -hmm. So what we're proposing would actually allow that to occur. Although if someone wanted to tear down and rebuild a duplex, I mean, uh, with what we're, what's being recommended, uh, that that's another scenario in which that could happen. Um, there was an analysis. Um, I'm going to have to dig through some slides. So I apologize if you'll um, indulge me. So um, that's not it. <laughs> so um, we looked at um, potential subdivisions within current RS1 lots based on um, some uh, some criteria, uh, looking at it under existing criteria of, of the minimum lot area of 33,000 square feet. If um, in order to subdivide, you'd have to have 66,000 square feet. There's a lot of caveats to this analysis. We, it was, if you remember, there's so many disclaimers because, you know, staff only has so many time and tools to, in order to do these analyses and you'd probably get more something, something way more accurate from a, from a, a licensed surveyor, but nonetheless, we tried our best and under existing standards out of the, we didn't look at all, there were those two lots at the very, uh, south um, along Timberglade that were excluded from this. But um, looking at the other three areas out of uh, 114 lots, only two lots we we saw were potentially subdividable. So you get you get some more housing units out of that. Um, uh, if we dropped that minimum lot area to 22,000 square feet, that raises to 10. Now, this doesn't include uh, also uh, the, uh, the financial wisdom of such a decision. So we applied that constraint to the analysis. And when we stuck to the current uh, lot area standards, we only found one lot was potentially subdividable. When we lowered the minimum lot area to 22,000 square feet, three lots. So this gives you some idea of what the development potential is of current RS1 lots under existing and, and potential uh, lot areas, and it's it's not much. Um, so uh, some of these uh, options before you might not yield uh, a, a lot of development activity anyways. So um, take that for what it's, whatever it's worth. Thank you, Mayor, if I might, just a couple more. Um, so if we if we have this R, RS1 zoning and we have a process by which a neighborhood could come forward and they all agreed to do that and they would need to meet some sort of steep slope or wetland or something like that, according to the presentation that we saw for 5.1, uh, almost the entirety of steep slope lots not included on the bluff are in West Bloomington. So a neighborhood, including my own neighborhood that has a number of steep slopes, could come in and ask for that could get rezoned to RS1 and could effectively circumvent the R1 zoning changes that we made because the lot size would change to 33,000. So no one could do any of the things that we did in the R1, but only in West Bloomington, only if they happen to have steep slopes or be near water. I mean, this, is, this seems like an enormous loophole for some neighborhoods to just say, you know what, we don't want to have that same zoning as everybody else. I don't know if there's a question in there. That's probably a statement. <laughs> um, and that's, that's frankly one of my biggest concerns is this is driving a truck through our R1 zoning changes, but only for part of our community. Um, so let me see. I think I had another question here. Um, no, I, that'll be it for now. I just personally, I, I don't believe in the zoning. I think I've made that clear. I think I made it clear tonight and previously, and, and I, I don't mean it personally uh, or anything like that. I just, um, I completely agree with Councilmember D'Alessandro that these things are important. And if what we want to do is protect these, let's protect these things. Let's look at steep slopes. Let's look at what more we can do on trees. Let's look at what more we can do on wetlands if we need to do more on wetlands, although a lot of that state. Let's do those things. The lot size, this seems 
entirely about having large lots. Um, and, and I see that because I know the ones Timber Glades in mine, um, right next to it along the wetland is R1 zoning on the east side of that same wetland. So R1 zoning is perfectly fine next to this wetland, except where you want to have a large lot. Um, the two lots on Normandale make absolutely no sense to me why they're RS1. I mean, they're adjacent to a um, townhome complex, adjacent to a gas station and a liquor store. You know, uh, they just happen to be large lots. So. Councilmember Rivas and then Councilmember D'Alessandro. Councilmember Rivas. Sorry, as you all know, I'm new. I don't know anything. I'm just learning, trying to absorb as much as I can. Um, but I do have a question for you. What is the purpose and intent of this RS1 zoning? I mean, I, I have read a lot about it, but I don't quite understand what's the main purpose of it. I, I mean, I wanted to ask a lot of the questions that have already been asked. So all, all I, I want to know at this point is, what is it exactly for? What What's the purpose of it? Yes. Uh, uh, Mayor, uh, council member. Yeah, so uh, this is the RS1 intent. Um, the the bigger fe feature is just preservation of large single family lots that exhibit certain environmental characteristics. Um, currently, it's uh, steep slopes, significant vegetation, wetlands. So those are those environmental features that are considered part of or or. Well, as it's worded right now, it's it could be one or the other. It could be an area that's large lot, but it also has steep slopes. It's large lot and has significant vegetation. It's large lot or it has wetlands. So there's um, you know numerous numerous permutations of what could define an RS1 lot, but um, those are some of the characteristics that uh, the city has defined as being part of the RS1 district. And then uh, the second part of that uh, intent, protect natural resources, ensure compatible redevelopment. So that's that's what it's for is, I mean, and the, it's similar to other communities that actually have a uh, large lot district. So, um, uh, sorry, I'm going <laughs> to go to another slide that I prepared. Okay, so uh, we surveyed um, several peer communities and looked at their large lot standards and also compared them to their smaller single family uh, zoning districts. Um, there's uh, a lot of communities that have uh, large lot districts. Um, uh, Eden Prairie, for instance, has a large lot district uh, with a minimum area of 44,000 square feet, you know, an acre in size. So it's, it's, I mean, that's, that's the defining feature, but I believe that's um, my interpretation is that's motivation to, uh, identify those areas that don't want to be or that the city doesn't want to heavily develop because that might compromise the environmental integrity of the resources on that property. But I mean, maybe that's a little bit of speculation, but nonetheless, that's the same thing that's reflected in Bloomington and within that intense statement for RS1. Okay. Thank you. I don't mm -hmm. have any other questions. Council member D'Alessandro. Uh, so thanks. I, I, I understand, um, Councilmember Nelson, I understand where you're coming from. Um, we, we, you know, I, I think that, I think that it's reasonable to understand that, um, larger lot sizes, whatever the reason behind them, um, enable more natural and environmental stability. Um, the changes that we've made to the zone for RS for R1, um, including the the um, the options for uh, additional impervial impervious surfacing and all that kind of stuff, it are antithetical to environmental controls and environmental support. Right? We did all those things in R1 to enable uh, densification of the neighborhoods, and I and I get that, but I don't think that I don't think we would actually be serving ourselves correctly if we said, okay, make everything R1 and then put all of those constraints on there and then reactively find the places where we need to make exceptions. We already know, like, the, 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 the city of Bloomington is, from an, an, an ecological perspective and a geological perspective, is 
already set out. It Yes, the east side of Bloomington does not have slopes like the west side of Bloomington does. The east side of Bloomington does not have, uh, does not have um, you know, wetlands, uh, although maybe it did 50 years ago and we already screwed it up. But I'm open to, like, buying them all back and p- turning them back. God knows we need a park in the east Bloomington. So let's do that. Um, you know, let's buy the farm and turn it into a park. I would be up for that like you would not believe, like 100%. So I am here for that. But I, but I think that it's – it. I, I struggle with policy that says, well, if it doesn't work for everyone, it shouldn't work for anyone. I struggle with that. And I, and I also struggle with the idea that when you look at the, the goals that we're trying to have from a climate mitigation perspective, we should be spending our time making more investment on the east side in these heat islands to get tree canopy back and all these other things. But I don't think we should do that at the, at the expense of the stuff we have on the west side just because it happens to be on the west side. Uh, you know, I mean, it is, it is the topology of Bloomington. It's because we have a riverbed and a river valley, and, like, that's just the facts. Um, I would be down for... Re- restoring some of East Bloomington back to some of its cool, more ecologically sound and, and significant places, you know, uh, in, uh, environments, I'd be down for that. I would. I don't want to say, because we can't do that, we should go ahead and, like, make things bad for the West Side, too. That's, and I don't, I do not mean to imply that that's what you said. I think that the unintended consequence of R1 everywhere, given the changes we've made, might in fact encourage some of that, especially around impermeable surfaces and other stuff like that, where where we did basically say density at all costs in a lot of ways. So thanks. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Lohman, and, and a reminder, Council Members, we're, we're trying to get direction to staff here. And we will ultimately get to a, a hearing of some kind, but uh, we just want to make sure that we get direction to staff in terms of what we would like to see here. And, and even our comments, all, all the comments are great, and I think it, staff will take that back and work with it. Thank you, Mayor. And that's sort of what I, I you know, I, I hear exactly what Councilmember de is was saying here. And I think there is... There's something unique about this, um, and I don't. I'm not sure. You know, in terms of what I'm seeing here, um, it, it's not getting quite there. And so, my question for staff would be, um, you know, if we were to drop the, um, you know, the 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 uh, requirement down to twenty-two thousand or, or something less than that, does that start to take in some of the east side of Bloomington? What number does that that take? Because I know that uh, on the southern part of my of my district, there there's certainly homes that, that that would fit in that twenty two thousand. Or, you know, do you have any maps like that? Um, um, and what I'll just say is, um, yeah. So not, that's interesting there. Um, when you when you look, go back to that map there. That that, that is a, that is an interesting map. Sorry, Mayor Council Member. Uh, so this is a map showing uh, R one lots. That and it does include some of the bluff lots, so maybe that those ought to be ought to have been excluded from this analysis. But these are lots uh, that are R one that um, uh, have a an area of thirty three thousand square feet and a lot frontage of sixty feet. Lot frontage is not the correct width measure by which we uh, assess lots, um, but nonetheless, it was the best proxy uh, measure we had available. Um, so. This is uh, 33,000 square feet minimum lot area, and this is 22,000 square feet okay. minimum lot area, just so you know so, the difference. So, you know, I, I think, you know, <clears throat> and I think if we look at, and what I, I ask folks to think about uh, is that, you know, those folks who came before us took part of the city, and they preserved part of the city, uh, you know, for natural resources uh, to, to be able to do that. And I think that those same same folks also looked at this, you know, this particular district, you know, um, and I, I'd be more inclined to think that, uh, that that they didn't want to do that if, you know, they said, oh, we just want large lots, you know, but what they entrenched inside of that RS1 district was this idea around natural resources. And, and so uh, this council member is looking at that 
and and trying to figure out. I, I do think there is some distinctions. Now, I don't know what that is, what that number is, and that's where I'm troubled with and trying to figure out how how, how to make this work. And and certainly, I'm not going to be able to support something that is only in the west side of Bloomington. Um, but it's got to be greater than the west side of Bloomington, and it does need to fit in the corridors. I mean, that that conservation corridor piece, that being outside of this, I, I cannot support that. If that is not included in here, then, then wow, I guess we are looking at R1 all across the city. But I do think there's something to what, what, what the council member, Dallas Honor, has said that I think we need to think about uh, – in terms of what we're leaving for future generations. And I think that, that, that we've got to be crafty and figure out how does that fit into the future. I certainly support the changes that we made with R1, uh, but I think we can do something unique here with this, this RS um, uh, district and area. And I'm not satisfied with just, you know, just giving up and just turning it all across the city that way. I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to work to try to figure out a way in which we can make this work. So that, that's my, my thought about this. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, it, it sounds to me like we we're, we're still cooking here, and um, which we are want to do, which this group is want to do. Uh, I I would recommend that um, you take back the comments that you've heard this evening. Uh, I don't know that we're ready for prime time and ready for a a, a formal hearing on this yet. But I think uh, maybe to to try and continue working on this and try and figure out. Maybe we, if there's a needle that could be threaded, that we could work through all of this, okay. and it might be a. I, I understand it's kind of a, a, a tall task for you. I, I get that, I'm, and but I appreciate the effort that you do put into it because I think you could hear right now if we, if we had a, if we had a, uh, an ordinance or in a public hearing in front of us right now, I don't know where we'd end up. Hmm. So, okay. all right, fair enough. Uh, Mayor, uh, uh, City Council, thank you very much. Yep. Thank you. Our final study item of the evening is item 5.3. And this is a discussion of accessory dwelling units, fences, and window covering standards. I think back in uh, December, I believe it was, Mr. Markegaard, we had a conversation on these things. And I think there were some council questions and discussion wanting a little bit more context around where we stood how we got to where we are in terms of those three topics right now. Yes. Narbosi Council Members, uh, Council flagged three items uh, for additional discussion back on December 18th, uh, namely detached uh, ADU or accessory dwelling unit placement standards, uh, fence placement standards, and then window covering standards. So tonight, what I want to do is review each of these three standards, uh, discuss the intent, and then receive uh, council guidance on potential modifications, uh, if any are desired. So the first uh, standard we'll talk about is uh, detached accessory dwelling unit placement. Uh, the current standard was adopted in 2022, and that was the uh, point at which the council started allowing um, detached accessory dwelling units. There are two uh, key provisions in terms of where you can place a detached accessory dwelling unit. First of all, uh, the ADU must meet setback standards for the principal dwelling. In the R1 district, which is most of Bloomington, uh, that would mean 30 feet from the street, uh, 30 feet from a rear property line, and 10 feet from either of the side property lines. Secondarily, another standard says that uh, the ADU must not be closer to a street than the principal structure. Uh, that's the same standard that applies currently to sheds or detached garages in Bloomington. So if you think about uh, a typical lot in Bloomington uh, that's uh, interior or internal lot, not a corner lot, um, there is not a reasonable uh, viability to place the ADU anywhere but in the rear yard because most lots do not have sufficient side uh, setback or front setback to allow an ADU in that area. So uh, there was not a lot of policy discussion uh, when this came through in 2022 about uh, alternatives. So what was adopted was to treat ADUs similar to uh, sheds or detached garages uh, in that regard. 
couple of situations where uh, there may be interest in having an accessory dwelling unit uh, in the front yard. One would be a bluff lot. Uh, so we have a lot of bluff lots in Bloomington that have very high setbacks from the street. Um, and universally, they have very steep slopes in the back of those lots. So it would be, in many cases, very difficult to have an accessory dwelling unit in the rear. In some cases, uh, there would be an opportunity on the side of the house, but uh, there may be some desire to place an accessory dwelling unit in the front yard in a situation like the one uh, shown here on the screen. Another uh, situation where this may come into play is on a corner lot. In, in this case, I'm showing the city-owned uh, corner lot at 82nd and Fremont. Um, is currently vacant, and if this were sold for development, let's say a developer wanted to provide a, both a house and an accessory dwelling unit, uh, the current standards would require something like uh, what you would see on the screen. The uh, ADU would have to be set back from uh, Fremont. Um, alternatively, a buyer may want to place the ADU on the other side, which would not be allowed today. Uh, a reason for that would be if they wanted to combine it with a garage, for example. In this case, access is not allowed to 82nd Street, so it would have to come off of Fremont, uh, which would make it difficult to combine an ADU with a garage um, and yet not have the ADU between the dwelling and Fremont Avenue. So uh, basically... Uh, front yard placement is not allowed or placement between the primary structure and the street today. Um, I'm open for any questions on that standard or any direction on modifications that, that you may want to see. If we did do modifications on that, uh, we would do that with our missing middle housing a study and ordinance that uh, it's planned to come forward and yet this year. Thank you, Mr. Markegaard. And I think one piece that you left out of this, I think what drove a lot of this conversation back in 2022 were the notion of the drop pods that were becoming more common in the Twin Cities. Basically, you know, small units, dwelling units, sitting in the, in the driveway, basically, is what it was. And I think that was driving, that drove a lot of the conversation that we had. This notion that, you know, to, we, we didn't want fish houses, basically, in the, in, in the front yard, in, in the driveway, and people living in them. And that's kind of where the conversation went. And so uh, as we as we had this, that really was the, the primary point we were making, I think, with uh, not wanting to do this in the front in the front yards of, of any units. Councilmember D'Alessandro? Yeah, I think, I think uh, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Um, I think, you know, I feel like this study item is like Lona's beefs from December. <laughs> oh, so thank you, Glenn and team. Um, my, my only comment was, Exactly to uh, Mr. Markegaard's point, which was there are several properties, you know, could, could we uh, where where the only place that you could put a an accessory dwelling unit, for example, is in the front of the house because of the setback and, and the slope conditions and things like that. If that's something that we could do on a conditional basis or if like it was a, you know, an, um, uh, a variance initiated by the by the property owner or something like that. And we thought that, OK, we don't need to change the rules, but we might enable or allow for a variance on conditional basis. I think I, that probably would solve the problem, generally speaking. Um, I just didn't don't think that we knew if that was doable or not. I, I certainly agree if I'm in a, you know, a fairly traditional lot with a 30 foot setback, um, having a, you know, 700 square foot ADU in the front of my yard is not the right answer and certainly not in my driveway. Although people park their RVs and live in them. I'm just saying like they do. It, it's a happening whether we like it or not. Um, so, so the, so I guess from my perspective, the, 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 the question that I had was, is there a way, even if it's by exception to accommodate if an individual would want to put an ADU in their front lot, because that is, Number one, they have a large lot. Number two, they have uh, that's the space that they have available to do that. And and you know, would we consider that as an option, or would we just reject it outright? And and I I guess I don't know. I I don't know if how practical it would be. Maybe you could help Mr. Markegaard or Mr. Verbrugge if to to set it up in such a way that it, each are reviewed. You know, they're if they meet certain criteria, but they do have to come through planning commission and or 
the city council for review. Uh, and I don't know if that's more work than it's worth. I don't know how many lots we'd be talking about that would that this might apply to if if it's not buildable or an ADU is not possible in the back or the side yard, that kind of thing. Um, I'm spitballing here, and I'm not sure what might be doable or not. Yeah, uh, Mayor Bussey and Councilmember D'Alessandro, one idea that jumps to mind is the possibility of a conditional use permit process to have a, a ADU in the front yard or between a primary structure and the street, and maybe there's certain standards that would have to be met, such as... Um, you know, no viable alternatives that are code compliant. Mm -hmm. And then that could trigger a, a review process. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm fine with that. I think, um, you know, I think your, your two examples that you gave here were really good ones, right? One was, hey, there's this large space. It's up against a, 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 de a steep slope. That's the place they can put it. We want to encourage people to do that. Can we find a way? The second one with the 82nd in Fremont is another great example of, you know, um, how that's, you know, from my point of view, that doesn't look that different, having it on one side of the house versus the other side of the house. Um, and so if, if it doesn't bother anybody and it's, again, uh, something we want to encourage in terms of people using these as as uh, density building uh, opportunities within the within the um, with the area, um, then I'd want to encourage that. Um, there was one other thing about ADUs, but this is this we're talking about detached here, but I, and I don't see it come back up, but I'll bring it up on another Time, uh, on another thing, um, but I, I'm I think um, I don't think that there needs to be modification as much as flexibility to enable like an an uh, um, an initiated option, and and if that would work. I, I think that would be something to, that we'd want to encourage in the cases that I mean, who knows? We might only get ten or twelve over the course of the next ten years, mm -hmm. but again, it's ten or twelve houses that people have access to that they didn't have to before. So perhaps bring back a, a conditional use permit possibility for us to consider we can do that very good thank you any anybody else that you don't care <laughs> like i said this is gonna be all alone huh? sorry <laughs> yeah the the next item has to do with uh, privacy fence placement standards current standards were adopted in 2008 and then I'll explain the standard and then come back a little bit to the kind of purpose behind it. But um, as you can see the from the diagram on the right, again, a fairly typical rectangular lot in Bloomington. The area um, sur surrounded in the green um, uh, line, basically with anywhere within that area, you can have up to a six foot tall uh, privacy style fence so full full privacy so that's in the rear yard and the side yard but then between the house and the street you can have a fence but it's limited to four feet in height and to more of an open style so no more than 50 percent opaque so that could represent uh, like a chain link fence or split rail or a picket style fence uh, that's more uh, open in nature and really the purpose behind that standard, really twofold. Uh, first of all, the idea of crime prevention through environmental design or SEPTED. Um, this idea of having eyes on the streets, uh, natural surveillance, um, that uh, you know a, a criminal would be uh, more reluctant uh, to engage in criminal activity if they felt like they were being observed. Um, than if uh, they were not. So that's uh, one side of uh, how Bloomington got to the standard. The other side was a desire to maintain the open design uh, character along streets. Um, so that definitely played in as well. So then if we look at a corner lot uh, situation, again here, um, the full privacy fence up to six feet would be allowed side and rear but between the um, dwelling and the street on both sides in this case, because it's a corner lot, uh, only a four foot open style fence would be allowed in those areas. Uh, one thing to point out in a corner lot situation is frequently what seems like the uh, side lot to one resident to their neighbor either across the street or uh, adjacent 
to that neighbor, it seems like a front yard for them. So we uh, frequently run into that situation where, um, you know, the front yard to one resident feels like a side yard to another. So here we can see two corner lots uh, with a different style of fencing. Uh, one is uh, code compliant, the one on top, the more open style fence, four feet in height. The bottom one, uh, I'm sure legally non-conforming, it predated our ordinance, but there, um, you know, full privacy fence, uh, it's probably six feet in height. Um, so I guess that's a little overview on how we got to the standards that we have. Any either questions on the standards or direction on modifications? Questions, Council? Council Member D'Alessandro. <laughs> I told you this is like Lona's list today. Uh, so I have I have explicit examples of this, and maybe they were you know non legally non conforming because they came in before code or whatever. But I have two lots, one at eighty six and Emerson, and one at eighty six and Dupont. They're the exact same house. They're built during the same time frame. You know how that goes. They sit on a corner lot, so they have a front lot and they have a side lot. Um, the house at 86 in DuPont has a six foot fence. It almost looks exactly like the one in your picture here. 86 in Emerson, they were told they couldn't build a fence on their side lot. So I, I do have a specific question about corner lots and the utilization of corner lots when you talk about certain areas of the city, right? We consider 86th Street to be a, a fairly significant road. Emerson is not a cons considered a, a significant road, neither is DuPont, right? So you have the, the more of an, a, 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 a connector road and then you have a neighborhood road is there a reason we wouldn't consider some um, options for privacy for side for corner lots that have a side yard for which uh, on which that side yard is not on a collector or a major road um, that that's really the one thing I wanted us to, to ponder as a council um, to enable folks to um, you know, if they have young children or whatever, and that's their lot, um, that they can put some uh, fencing, privacy fencing, on their side lot um, that that would would work for for them. Um, like I said, it, it has happened all over the neighborhoods. You can see them everywhere, um, and uh, it's a little hard for me to justify when I go to talk to my constituent, who literally lives down the block from an exact scenario that they're trying to achieve to say like, oh, I'm sorry, they built that before 2008. So, you know, that, oops, my bad. That was my fault. You know, so sorry. You know, you just, you, bad timing. You bought your house in 2020. I don't know. It. I think we can do better. And I'm wondering if there's a reason not to consider offering a side lot privacy fence option for people. Councilmember Lowen? Uh, I'll go one step further because this was also one on my list too, so I, I'll join in with oh, you on this one. You're not by yourself on this one. So I'm not sure, Mayor, if you remember this, and maybe, uh, Nelson, you were on the council too when it, when it happened, but we, um, I think it was on Xerxes, I'm trying to think of where, and the gentleman came in and he gave a pretty good case for exactly what Councilman Delisano was talking about, and then we, we, we made an exception and we allowed him to build the fence. Um, and I'm trying to think uh, exactly where it was. It's Xerxes, and um, I'd have to get the map out here. And I, want, and I don't want to, and I don't want to, oh, you got it? Yeah. Yeah, 108th. 108th. And, and that's, how does that fit into all this? I mean, because we, we did exactly what she's talking about. I mean, literally, we did that. Uh, you know, from, we had the rationale. I can't remember all the rationale, but uh, we did exactly what you're talking about for that for that one gentleman on, the, on, the, on that corner. So... Yeah, uh, Mayor Bussey, I, I don't recall Lohman. it, to be honest. Yeah, there have been several variance requests uh, since the this was adopted in 2008. Um, that particular one, I believe, staff recommended denial, but the council did approve it. Uh, we've had several others where the council has denied uh, the variance request, um, but certainly that route is open to residents. Um, you would have to determine that they meet all the findings. Uh, practical difficulty and that it's not economic in nature, et cetera. So you're saying, Mr. Mark, there, there is a, a path forward if a resident wanted to do this type of thing, as, as Councilmember Loma just kind of described. So I don't know if any changes are necessary or if you just make known the path forward to folks that 
Well, I, I, Mr. Mayor, I, I think the, that's fair. Um, I think the the hard no was given in the in the you know the resident didn't know that there would be an option to, but it's expensive too. I think that the if the if they initiate that they have to pay and everything as well, don't they? Don't we charge folks for those kinds of reviews? Um. Ms. Mercury? Yeah, uh, Mayor Bussey, there's a, a fee, I believe it's $220, um, that helps defray the cost of notices and the yeah. staff and I, review. And I guess, yeah, fair enough. I, I understand all that. I, I just, if we believe that, if we believe that we're going to see them happen and we believe that we don't care and we're likely to approve them, then I don't know why we just don't go ahead and make the policy happen so that people can just get what they need done and not be in the, like have to go through a process that takes weeks and months or whatever. Mm -hmm. I, but because I can't see candidly, I guess my point is in my area, which isn't every area, I, I can't see the downside of a privacy fence on a side lot. On a corner. I, I mean, it. It. I get. You know. I mean, heck, there are cities. There's, there's, units in this town that have a fence around the entire T of their property, right? That are not conforming. Um, I'm not suggesting that we see that at all. But in these corner lot areas where you know you have a connector or arterial on one side and you have a neighborhood on the other, neighborhood street on the other, it seems like the neighborhood street doesn't necessarily qualify as the as the um, open design along streets requirement because it's not really, that's what, you know, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm I'm throwing it out there for consideration, and if you guys think that the variance process is the best way to go, I understand, but I wanted to at least raise it since I have constituents asking sure. me about it. Sure, and and to be honest, uh, I don't, so I haven't heard this. I mean, I, I mean, I do, you know, and I, they're all, but but in my neighborhood, we, I, I don't see that in my neighborhood, and we don't we don't talk about it in the neighborhood. So, um, so it's, I don't know. I, I look to the rest of the council. Is this something we want to consider? Is this uh, worth Putting the time and the effort in, asking uh, staff to look into this, or, or just to rely on the uh, the variance. Well, I think that you know, I, I think the problem with relying on the variance is what she 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 mentioned. It's, it's a good one, right? You know, we talk about equity and inclusion, and you know, in our terms of our new, um, and in terms of our new standard, and I think we got to think about that. You know, is that a dissuasion from folks being able to do that? That that two hundred dollar fee. Um, I don't think it is, but that could prevent somebody from doing it, and uh, um. You know, and I can't, you know, I, I see all these other standards here. But I was here, I initiated that one. I did that one. I voted for that one. So, I mean, so I can't with a straight face sit here and tell you, well, no, you can't do that in your neighborhood or we shouldn't look into it. So I, you know, I mean, that was a different council too. So um, I think most of the folks have changed up here other than, um, I, I think, Sean, you told me that, no, you would have never done that. <laughs> so... <laughs> Councilmember Nelson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, I would be in favor of doing this without a variance. Um, I mean, I think variances have strict standards that, um, you know, there has to be a significant need um, typically in there, and, and it's going to sometimes be difficult to find that there's that strict need. I mean, the, you, the house has operated fine for the people living there without a fence for years to say that, oh, I have to have this fence now is a high standard to meet. Um, and yet I, I think they should be able to have the fence. And in, in terms of the process, I mean, I've, I know I've raised this before off of Minnesota Bluffs. There's a small lot community there that has some, um, I think one of them is a, actually a through lot. So it's, it's um the backyard and because of that setback it puts the fence into an odd location and then across the street from them uh, there's a side yard setback issue of where they could put the fence and that at the end of the day they're like what well, doesn't make sense to have a fence when I then only have a 10 foot yard to use it in it, it, it it's peculiar to that neighborhood because it is a small lot division they, they I mean they were purposely designed that way so they don't have much space to begin with and then with all the stuff. So that would be one thing I just add is to take a look at, um, clearly you have to have maintain views, clear view triangle, all of those things. I don't think anybody disagrees with that, but you know, they just like to be able to sit out there with their family and not have everybody driving down Minnesota bluffs looking at them. <laughs> Council Member Mua. Thank you, Mayor. I would agree with that. Uh, as someone who just rebuilt their fence two years ago, 
um, having to go through a variance process, pay that money. On top of the issue that I ran into is if I waited, I couldn't get on the list of uh, a contractor to come out and do it until the fall when I needed it in the summer. And so ultimately I made the decision to build it myself because it was cheaper and I could do it. But then to have to try to go through the process of getting a variance to allow me to do that, that like dissuaded me from doing any of that and just falling back into what was allowed currently at the time. So having that opportunity to have a non-variance um, opportunity to come to the city and say, hey, this is what I want to do. It still uh, remains uh, safe, but provides me more access to the yard because right now half of my yard is unusable because it's a side lot and I can't put a fence in there. My kids can't explore more. And so um, I would be supportive of that too. Because I don't honestly don't think, given the process and having been through it, that we would get significant numbers because there's a time sensitivity of when you need a book with your contractor. There's a money aspect to it because it gets more expensive the longer you wait. And so giving people the ability to quickly make decisions and move forward uh, while maintaining pop process with the city, I think, is a good option um, without slowing them down. Councilman Marivas? I support the to look into it. I, that's all I'll say. I'll keep it short. <laughs> I... Sounds like you have your direction, Mr. Marker Garden. Let's uh, figure out a way to make this work. And if I may, Mr. Mayor, it may be that it's a side lot versus front lot thing, right? I'm, nobody's talking about the front lots, right? I'm not that, but no. there's on a corner, you have to define one or the other. And I think right now most people are saying, oh, no, it's actually two front lots. And it's like it's not two front lots. Yeah. And I think that, that we, start, we start with that problem. And so if we can address it, I think it'd be great. Thanks for the consideration. Councilmember Carter, I'm sorry I didn't see you there. No, it's okay. Um, I would say in general, I'm supportive of having further conversations about it. Um, I will say personally, just like my personal opinion, like when I, there are some lots that I drive by, corner lots that when they, when there are the fences that are not in compliance, like it can, like it doesn't, it doesn't always look as good or like it kind of feels dis, like it can, creates a disconnection from like the rest of the neighborhood. I guess I'll just say that. And I don't know if there's any consequences to that. Um, and so I guess I would just be interested to know, um, you know, if we were to make the change, like, are there some unintended consequences that we should at least discuss to make sure that we're making a fully informed decision? Like in general, I kind of feel like, you know, if somebody wants to put a fence on a part of their lot so that their kids can play or they can have privacy, like, I'm just like, yeah, it seems like a no brainer, but I just feel like there might be some other things to consider. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm in support of having more conversations. Um, but I'm not committing to like which like if I would vote a certain way in the end or not, if that makes sense. Thank you, council member. And I think that's that's a good summation. I think to bring have staff bring something back to us. And, and obviously, if it's an ordinance change, I think we'd want to have, you know, we would have a public hearing and talk about talk, talk through it all um, and get public input as well. So I would agree with that. So. Yep. All right. Window coverings. Moving on. Uh, last item. Yeah, the so on window covering standards, they were adopted back in 2006. I would note that these standards apply only to commercial and mixed use districts. Um, I'll go ahead and read. This is straight out of the code. It says, for windows facing public or private streets or pedestrian corridors. No more than 25% of the total window area and no more than 25% of the linear eye level window width may be obscured by, and it specifically calls out signs, film coverings, product displays, or similar covering. And then it goes on to basically give an exception, which is, it says blinds, curtains, and temporary, um, and similar temporary coverings for privacy or sunlight control are permitted. So to show you one example, this is at France and Old Chacopee. Uh, this is a code compliant uh, bank of windows multi-tenant center along uh, Old Chacopee Road. You can see uh, meets the standard. There are windows that uh, have blinds behind them. Uh, I'm assuming for either privacy or sunlight control in those areas and, and the blinds are, are totally allowed. Uh, so that's not a violation, and you can see nowhere have the signs uh, covered more than 25% of the windows. So 
the reason behind the standard, again, very similar to the fence standards, it gets back to crime prevention through environmental design, the idea of having eyes on the streets, uh, natural surveillance of uh, those common areas, sidewalks especially. Uh, and then beyond just the crime prevention aspects, there's also the uh, idea of creating a more comfortable pedestrian environment, um, you know, walking down a sidewalk if uh, nobody can witness it except maybe people driving by. Uh, I think most people just feel more uncomfortable if uh, there are several, um, you know, opportunities for people to to see where you are. You just naturally feel more comfortable in that area. Uh, the big difference between film, for example, on windows that permanently covers it and uh, blinds is that people may or may not look out of blinds. Um, you know, it, you never know if somebody would, whereas if it's just totally covered the whole bank of windows with film, you know that nobody's going to be uh, looking out of those windows. So th those are kind of the two uh, reasons that we're behind the standard. Um, I'd point out, here's another example. This is uh, Fresh Time, the south side of Fresh Time Grocer. This is at uh, 80th and a half street near Penn Avenue. You can see some of these windows are covered in film. And as long as it doesn't exceed 25% of the, you know, either the linear eye width or the total window area, that's fine. So this is a code compliant example of where they have used film in certain rooms. I think uh, some of these rooms are like they might have a freezer there um, behind that area. So just want to point out that you can do even permanent uh, window covering as long as it's not over 25%. But are there any questions on this window covering standard or any uh, direction on modifications? Councilmember D'Alessandro? <laughs> you might as well. So this came up for me because of a specific situation with veterinary clinic and um, the, the challenges associated with um, having rooms for euthanizing pets that were could not be completely covered to provide privacy for uh, folks experiencing that pain and loss. So I wonder if there can be an exception in a particular situation where you have medical situation. Um, uh, that we could potentially consider something like that, where you have a particular medical or veterinary use um, that might be uh, something we can accept out of the normal policy. I completely understand the policy. Um, don't disagree with it. But, um, you know, the the fact is, you know, if, if anybody's ever dealt with, a, uh, you know, being in a medical environment or being in a veterinary environment where you're dealing with the euthanization of a pet or whatever, privacy is of the utmost and it's important. And it's exactly because of that pedestrian mod that pedestrian visibility that we're trying that they were uncomfortable with the choices that they had to make instead. Um, so, um, you know, I, I don't know if there's an option to go, hey, it can be up to 75 percent if it's a medical use or something to that effect. Mr. Markergaard, is, is there any are there any exceptions right now for medical use? I, I, I can think of an eye clinic right up the road here that is right on the street level. Yes, Mayor <clears throat> uh, Bussey, uh, there are no exceptions. However, uh, most of the medical uses use and, and veterinary uses use blinds, um, fairly significant full privacy blinds, uh, which is allowed uh, by code. They could also have permanent film, too, if it didn't cover more than 25% of the window bank. Um, I know, uh, for example, the Wellhaven uh, veterinarian and, and kind of dog daycare uh, combined use at, at Penn and American, they use uh, pretty significant blinds, um, for example. So that, that would be an option. I know, um, like, uh, I use the Fairview Clinic on 98th and have had mm -hmm. examination rooms right on, right along uh, Old Chocopee Road, and there, of course, they have the, the blinds uh, mm -hmm. drawn. Yeah, so I... I mean, blinds are an option, I would guess. They're just expensive. I mean, the, the fact is that the cost of, of blinds in, you know, if you if you want to sit down and talk with them, you can hear it. But it was, you know, a 10-digit addition to their, like, you know, because of their privacy blinds, right? Because they're high-density, they're 
they're you know opaque, et cetera. Um, it just costs a lot more for the people you know in small businesses to implement that. If they could put window film on these areas, um, it would not have cost that much, and they would have been not had to order them and wait eight weeks and all the other stuff that delayed their ability to open, et cetera, et cetera. So. My point is that there seems to be a legitimate use case potential for medical or veterinary use that we could consider to provide some vet, some optionality here. I'm okay if we say no, but I wanted to throw it out there since that happened recently and it affected a, uh, a good small business in our community. Mm -hmm. And I guess I, I knew you could spend a lot of money on blinds. I didn't know you had to spend that money on blinds. Well, I mean, it comes down to it like, you know, I, yes, you can go into a, a, a and get crappy blinds, but then you're not giving the privacy. And so if I'm somebody who is sitting in that space who's about to euthanize my dog, I don't want somebody to be peering in through a crappy blind and watching my, you know, my terribly oh. difficult circumstance, right? And so, I mean, that, that was the sensitivity that was brought to my attention in, in that particular scenario that made it, I mean, having had gone through it recently. Mm -hmm. um, yep. Yes, we lost our cat two weeks ago. So, Sorry. um you know, these things are these are things are important at the times that they're important, and I think they were trying to think ahead on that front. Got it. Thanks, Councilmember Carter. Um, I, I may have misheard you, Councilmember Dalton, but I think you said like a ten-digit number or something whenever you said the cost, and I, that's why maybe maybe Mayor Bussey was wondering about the cost. But um, I I am supportive, but I also feel like we have to take a more comprehensive view because I can think of a lot of I can think of several other kinds of businesses who would maybe prefer privacy. Um, and so uh, if we were to go down this route, I would just want to think a little bit more um, holistically, like if there are other kinds of businesses who might also be in that same position, like I think of like estheticians, people who are getting facials, like whatever. I mean, there's like all kinds of other um, businesses. So uh, that would be my comment. Councilmember Lohman. Uh, certainly sympathetic to the, uh, to the idea and I think we should look into it. But the question I, I have um, with some of these uses and those types of things is, um, you know, you know, I've been to several clinics and that kind of thing, you know, for those things that are sensitive uses, you know, are there other parts of the building that can be utilized uh, for those types of things, um, you know, it, that would keep it away from that? Or, you know, as, as you know, as the planner has mentioned here, uh, Mr. Marketer has mentioned, you know, having a couple of those rooms where you put the film down on it and then you kind of move forward. So I, I just, I, I'm, I'm nervous about making a wholesale change. Um, and, and 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 what my, I guess my fear is from a policy perspective is is what are you going to be putting in and out of this thing? And it's going to get it's going to get really tricky as we kind of get down there to to the individual things, and that's where I get nervous about uh, about this. I think we definitely ought to you know look into it, but I'm just concerned um, that that uh, that there may be a better way to to to, to, to rationalize or solve this. <laughs> Others. Mr. Mayor, just for clarification, I meant to say it was tens of thousands, ten thousand. I heard ten five figures digits. Also, and I was, yeah, I apologize. Now I, I think I, that's what Councilmember Carter. In my head and I couldn't come no, up. no, it was like it was the difference between like a couple of hundred versus like ten thousand yep, dollars, which is not insignificant. No, it's not. But not ten digits. I misspoke. I apologize. It's, a, it's not a ten million dollar. No, <laughs> sorry. Thank you for that. It's 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 late. I apologize. I now thank you, Councilmember Carter, for correcting me. Appreciate that. Uh, thoughts on this council? Um, I'm seeing shrugs. I don't. I wonder if there are. Uh, Mayor. Yes. I'm just wondering. I mean, we've talked about a couple of different things tonight, and I, you know, I know we just approved the planning commission work plan a couple of weeks ago. Um, I'm just wondering, like, if we're saying, "Yep, let's dig into some of these," does that mean that we are deprioritizing other things, or is this just going to go to the bottom of that list and we'll eventually get to it, whether it's the end of this year or next year. I'm just kind of curious, you know, again, if we're prioritizing these things, does that deprioritize other things? I, I, I would agree. And I don't know that I would put this as a high priority. Um, this would be, yeah. you know, if, if everything else, um, I, I just don't know that it, 
honestly, I, my, my own personal opinion, I don't know that it's a high priority, and I don't know that it can't be solved with other measures as well. So I don't know that we need to make a, a wholesale ordinance change uh, when, when there are other possibilities. You know, it's not, it's, uh, it, it's different than a, you know, a fence in the backyard is a little more significant than I think curtains or blinds in, in a, a privacy room, a privacy situation. I don't know. I appreciate that. Um, I just wanted to make sure we considered it. It is expensive for small businesses. To, to, some of these things just end up being cost prohibitive and, and take more time. It's not so much that the ordinance itself is a bad one as much as it can really slow down the process for some of our smaller businesses who are trying to get up and running. So we don't have to do anything about that, but maybe there's flexibility within the planning department to create exceptions or something then if that's the right answer, if we're not going to do something ordinance-wise. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Mayor, may I? Uh, Sorry. Let me let, let me have Councilmember Nelson jump in first, and then I'll come to you, Councilmember okay. Carter. Councilmember Nelson. Um, Mayor, if you, can you remind me or somebody? Uh, it, there is a work plan item for planning to look at being more small business friendly. That is true. Can we just throw this in with that? Yeah. That is true. That's a good That'd be a good solution. Look at you solving problems. Well done. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> Councilmember Carter. <laughs> I was going to say great minds think alike yeah. I, that was exactly what I was going to say yeah. I saw your idea and I took it <laughs> Ooh, very good that's a fine compromise fine Appreciate compromise the consideration. Okay. thank you very good Mr. Markegaard thank you thank you is there anything else for Mr. Markegaard tonight no, thank you We will wrap up our meeting this evening as we always do item 5.4, our city council policy and issue update. Quick review of our city council listening session, which is the most attended city council listening session that we've had since we changed the listening sessions, uh, thanks to our friends, uh, our bird watching friends. Uh, Sally Ness was there uh, with concerns about obstructed handicap parking at 821 Park Avenue. We agreed to take a look into it and encouraged her to make a police call if uh, she saw instances of illegal uh, handicapped parking or blocked handicapped parking within that parking lot. Chris Ann Loria was there, and this was representing the bird watching group, uh, talked about restoring. Uh, she's a member of Restore the Nine, and they are a group that is uh, uh, intent on protecting and restoring the Nine Mile Creek Corridor and uh, <clears throat> had a lot of... Uh, ideas and, and thoughts regarding the work that's going to be going on as part of the Nine Mile Creek restoration effort that uh, was passed last uh, last November by voters in Bloomington. So we'll be, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, working with them on, uh, I invited them to be part of the community engagement and input on that. Uh, Amanda Heiser was there. Uh, she was encouraging that Bloomington continue the protection of trades and construction workers in, uh, in Bloomington, especially in new construction. And uh, Talk specifically about some some specific uh, uh, items such as wage wage theft and and some of the work that we've been doing about worker protection, and then Dan Mahoney had uh, some frustrations about his garbage pickup service, how he has not uh, he's had a couple of times where he hasn't gotten his garbage picked up on Friday, and then he gets held off until Monday. I think Councilmember Nelson reminded us that indeed it was in this contract that if there was a miss on Friday then haulers are required to come back out on Saturday to do the pickup. So uh, we, we need to consider, we need to continue to work with uh, Dan on that and continue to work with every time uh, we want to, and we told Dan this and others this as well, every time there's a missed pickup, please do call in and let the city know about it. We'll get the, we'll get the trucks back out there to pick up for you, but also we want to know who is missing pickups either individually or across uh, neighborhoods in, in the city of Bloomington. And um, as I said, that was a, we, had a, we had a full house at our listening session tonight. So, good. Mr. Verbrugge, anything to add? Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. I do have one, I uh, won't say a substantial item, but more than 30 seconds. Uh, I don't like to read to you usually, but I'm going to read to you for a moment. Um, last week we were um, alerted that the Metropolitan Council uh, was uh, going to um, was going to delay or defer funding for the Livable Communities um, Act. So <clears throat> the Community Development Committee of Met Council met last Monday. 
uh, while they were discussing the, the LCAs, that's the Livable Communities Act, uh, fund distribution plan, um, they had a fair amount of discussion between staff and the, the committee. Uh, and the committee voted to fund the tax base revitalization account and the local housing incentives account for 2024. But they voted uh, four to three to pause funding for transit oriented development and the livable communities development account program. Um, both of those programs uh, with the intent of reviewing those programs during 2024 before potentially restoring funding in 2025. Um, so Metro Cities uh, is, uh, their, their, um, their policies support the LCA program access to cities across the region. Uh, it supports flexibility in the program criteria and, and uh, supports efforts to promote local participation. Um, and they also stipulate since Metro Cities is the primary representative for our um, cities in the region working with the Met Council that any changes to LCA programs uh, really need to be done in part with participation and input of Metropolitan City officials. And so this one just kind of sprung up in the committee and now it's going to the full body on Wednesday. So what we would like to do in support of uh, Metro uh, Cities and our own concerns about that um, funding stream because we do have projects uh, that are in the pipeline here that are planning to apply to these accounts. Um, we think that we need to maintain the funding in 2024. So I have uh, a letter that our staff drafted for the mayor's signature to send to uh, Council Member Pacheco, our uh, Met Council representative, so that he sees where we are and we're on record before the full council um, uh, considers it on Wednesday afternoon. And it, it simply says it's been brought to our attention that the council uh, uh, community development committee is recommending pausing uh, funding, uh, strongly urging not to approve the committee's recommendation. Bloomington, like many other cities, regularly submits LCDA funding requests to assist development projects that advance regional goals. We've discussed the LCDA program with Bloomington property owners and developers who are likely to make applications in 2024 and the proposed pause to the funding could well result in delays to development projects and reduce housing production in the city of Bloomington as we strive to meet our 2030 housing goals. So if you're generally comfortable with that, um, we'll have the mayor sign that and we'll ship it off to the Met Council. Okay. Pretty good. Okay. All right, uh, one other item is I want to offer congratulations because about uh, two hours ago, our assistant city manager, Michael Sable, was formally approved by the Maplewood City Council to be their next city manager. Congratulations, Mike. It's well deserved. Congratulations, Mike. Well deserved, and we're going to miss you. Well done. We'll have, we'll have more opportunity, I think, to fetch you in the future, right? Very good. <clears throat> Council, anything to add tonight? Council Member Loman. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm surprised that the city manager didn't mention the uh, huge news of us. Uh, <laughs> and I'm not going to. It was a week ago. Week ago and there's so many other things that have happened. So I'll pause and see if he wants to say anything. Uh, I think he knows what I'm talking about because I don't want to steal your thunder. Uh, thank you, uh, Council Member Lohman, and uh, appreciate you giving me the opportunity to talk about it again. Uh, we had briefed the city council back in. Uh, September, as a matter of fact, that um, our um, our local district of Rotary was uh, uh, partnering with some of our surrounding districts uh, to put forward an application to host the Rotary International Convention in Minneapolis in 2029. And um, when last I, I talked to the council about that, it's because the site selection committee was coming here uh, to review the Minneapolis proposal. And uh, we learned a couple weeks ago that uh, we were chosen by the Board of Directors of Rotary International to host. Uh, so forecasted attendance is probably 17,000 visitors uh, to the region in 2029. And uh, it'll be at the Minneapolis Convention Center. And so you may be asking, well, why, why are we getting excited about something that's going to be at the Minneapolis Convention Center is because um, the the application that put forward really depends on the 
the partnership of all three cities of St. Paul, Minneapolis, and Bloomington. And as you know, uh, Bloomington really is the epicenter of hospitality here uh, in the region. We drive the uh, hospitality economy with the Mall of America and our 47 hotels and our nearly 10,000 hotel rooms. So we will have a, a good representation uh, for uh, helping to make sure that that event is going to be a very positive event. Uh, and frankly, it's a big win for the region. So I want to uh, acknowledge last Monday afternoon we had a press conference uh, to announce it and thank the governor uh, and um, Mayor Fry, who both made time in their calendar uh, to make that announcement. Mayor Bussey was there, a number of other um, leaders from Rotary and some other places. So it's, a, it's just a really good win for our region, uh, and it's a really uh, great event. Uh, for people who aren't familiar with Rotary, their motto is service above self, and uh, they have, uh, they have a, a substantial uh, footprint around the globe. So this is, this is going to be a really, really neat opportunity. Thank you, Councilmember Lohman. Yeah, thank you. I want to just be sure they did that. And also, uh, you, know, you were on the planning committee uh, for that. I want to thank you for your leadership uh, uh, with that. And I just anecdotally, we had one hotel person who was very excited about uh, in Bloomington here that I attended this afternoon. And uh, he went on for many minutes talking about that. Um, so, uh, again, congratulations and thank you for that. It's just another example of how we're an international city. Um, I wanted to mention just... Um, uh, one other thing uh, that I had the opportunity to attend with uh, Council Member, uh, uh, oh, wow, I'm getting tired. <laughs> we went to the Ellers Conference. Uh, Vivas, thank you. <laughs> I'm just totally <laughs> looking at you. I know your name, uh, Rivas. We both uh, went to the uh, Ellers Conference, and uh, just an excellent uh, experience. I know a number of other council members have had the opportunity to go uh, there. Um, uh, this year was a year where they had the property tax uh, uh, piece, and they talked about how they have updated the property tax to make it even more complicated uh, this year. And then um, another piece of the uh, – there were a number of public finance uh, pieces that we covered uh, during that training. And one of the major – pieces that they have a market update uh, piece. And one uh, item that, that seemed really interesting to me uh, among a number of things is this idea of uh, where commercial uh, um, uh, towers and that type of thing are losing value uh, in the marketplace and the impact that that's having across um, uh, across the country. I, I even saw uh, the Chairman Powell uh, having that conversation at 60 Minutes and how that may impact some of the smaller banks uh, uh, actually last month. So I just think that's something we ought to be, be thinking about as we kind of go into uh, our, our next uh, you know, budget piece as we kind of think about uh, what's the landscape of our, our property taxes and, and what that looks like uh, kind of going forward and what the impact would be to our residential uh, areas as the, that, that whole public finance piece changes and shifts. Thank you, Council Member. Council, anything else? Listen, I have a final thing to say. Okay. Mm -hmm. oh. And a lot of learning as well. It's, you know, it's very interesting to learn about the taxation mm -hmm. and what it takes to uh, financially run the city. It's very interesting. Good. I'm, I'm glad, glad you had the opportunity to do it. Thank you. I have the opportunity to do that. That's good. great. Very good. Council, with no more business on our agenda, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Second. Motion and a second to adjourn. No further council discussion. Ms. Mercer. Mayor Bussey. I <laughs> Councilman Carter. Hi. Council member Connor <laughs> Carter, my apologies. Okay, please, I get it. <laughs> council member D'Alessandro. Aye. Council member Lohman. Rivas. Council member Moa. Aye. Councilmember Nelson. Aye. Council Member Rivas. Aye. <laughs> Motion carries 7-0. We are adjourned. Thank you, Council, for the discussion tonight. Thanks to the staff for your work. Thanks to everybody who joined us this evening. Have a great rest of your week.